Welcome, welcome everyone to the Foul Play YouTube channel. We are doing a rebuttal on Convicting a Murderer, Episodes 1 and 2. That opening was awesome. Or intro, yep. rather. Definitely liked yeah, it. Doc, doc, you're muted. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, uh, that uh, introduction, oh my God, that was absolutely brilliant. Isn't that Fantastic. awesome? Yeah, that and, was incredible. And and I, I know she doesn't want credit. She doesn't care. But Katnett did that. Oh, Fantastic. She doesn't want to be named. <laughs> I know that, but she's it's it's her. You know, she spent time and she her free that, time. Yeah. She deserves that she little that. that ray of, ray of sunshine. It was really nice. Anyway, Doc. <laughs> Fantastic. Look, guys, thank you so much um, for for joining us today. Uh, my name is Dr. Silkman, and I'm from the Foul Play team. And uh, welcome, guys. It's great to be here. And uh, what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be continuing our rebuttal of uh, convicting a murderer. So what we're going to be doing today is combining episodes number one and episodes number two. Now, um, what we're trying to do is to, um, as I said, we're going to rebut uh, both episodes one and two, and what we've done is we've taken short clips. Now, we've tried to be uh, as respectful as possible because we want to warn everyone, and we'll put up the slides, that the uh, subject matter that we'll be discussing today uh, as part of the team is actually very, very sensitive and potentially very, very distressing. So what we've done is we've taken a few clips from episode number one and a few clips from episode number two. Uh, and we'll be discussing them today. And uh, hopefully, guys, that you will also have questions as well. Um, but I'm not going to waste too much time. I want to introduce our panel today. And uh, it's great to see we've got Sapacop as well. But first of all, let's start off with uh, Jack61. Jack61, how are you coming along? Good, sir. Hey, doing very well, Doc. Thanks for asking, and welcome to all my panel members and people in the live chat. It's uh, you know, another another Saturday, Sunday Monday morning for Doc and those across the international date line, but and late for our European friends. But you know, episodes one, two, and three, we've discussed it. Those that have watched the episodes a couple of times or more, uh, you know, they clearly can see that this went well outside what was ever shown in Making a Murderer, but they had to have this basis. This is, I mean, I don't, you know, I, I can't know what was in Sean and whoever else's mind when they uh, created the opening, uh, per se, for Convicting a Murderer, but reaching back 40 years into Stephen's past to then fast forward to drop it in into 2005 and so forth to make him a monster, that's what they did. That's my opinion. Anyway, looking forward to. Uh, I've seen the clips, obviously, but <laughs> yeah, I'm looking. I'm looking forward to some good discussion. Thanks, yep. everyone. Thank you so much, Jack This one and uh, yeah, just to answer a question. Yeah, today we're going to be continuing our rebuttal in convicting a murderer, and we'll be looking at both episode number one and number two. We'll try and finish it today uh, in our podcast, but if not, we'll spill over in tomorrow's podcast for open mic. Uh, next on the panel, we have just Rhonda. Just from the welcome. It's great to see you here. Oh, thank you, Doc. It's great to be here. It's great to be here um, on this amazing panel, as always. And uh, to see all these fabulous people in the chat ready to go with more interesting conversation about uh, this thing. So, um, yeah, for having me and. Uh, Look forward to Fantastic. crazy commentary. <laughs> thank you so much, Jess Ronda. And uh, thank you so much. And next, I'd like to welcome Sapper Cop, who is a new mod for Foul Play. Welcome, sir. How are you coming along? Oh, well, I'm uh, I'm awakened out of my food coma from the weekend, <laughs> or at least from Thursday and Friday. Um, been, a, been a while since I've been on a live, so need to needed to get on here and 
get my two cents in. But uh, yeah, honored to honored to be a mod and be part of the team, and uh, be interested to uh, tear up this absolutely shitty quote unquote documentary that they put out. So we we know it's been a while, Sapper, but so we'll be kind of gentle. <laughs> I, I had to. Sorry. Oh no. Thank you so much, Sapacop. Fantastic, and welcome, welcome to the team. Great to have you here. Uh, and next we have Katie. Katie, welcome. Great to see you here. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be on the team with you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And yes. you're a mod as well. I yeah, yes. She is. Fantastic. Got, she, Thank you so she's much. Got the yes. winch. Yeah, Thank I'm you. ready to wrap this shit show up. <laughs> Thank you so much, Katie. And we welcome Sapakop and Katie, our two new mods for Foul Play. Welcome. And next we have, I don't recall. Welcome, I don't recall. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to Rebutting Cam. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, we have uh, Neverly, who's got a bit more hair than me. I'm a bit jealous. <laughs> welcome, Neverly. It's a piece. I'm kidding. No. But um, hey, everybody, uh, great to be here. I wanted to welcome Sapper Cop and Katie did it as our newest mods as well. And happy to be here on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Yes, we got to do this because it's in demand. The first four episodes of Cam and making a monster, should I say. So, um, yeah, let's get on it and see what we got in the store for today. Welcome, Perfect. everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Neverly. And uh, if um, someone can actually see the people in chat, uh, will someone be happy enough to call out who's in chat? And, oh, my God, we've got 53 people already, which is awesome. And Jack61, at the same time, are you able to put up the very first slide, please? So who, who would like to who would like to call out who's in chat? Welcome, everyone. I, I can read them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Uh, let's see. First name I see is JD's. J Jack is in the chat as well. Sheila Hawkins. Hi, Sheila. Travis Kemp, good morning to you. Passive Bear, Anthony Hills. Sapper Cop is in the chat as well. Ravi. Hello to you. Phaedrax is in the chat. Glad to see you. Anthony Hills. Uh, we're always going to be late. You already know that. Just calm down. Don't get your don't get your whiteies in a bunch. It's okay. <laughs> Hi, Gloria. Gloria, it's great to see you under your scars. Anthony D. Hi, Coolidge. Great to see you here. John Wayne. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Let M. Welcome to uh, the chat. Nanny Nanny Angie Dickinson. You changed your name on me, and I forgot that that was a tongue twister for me. Great to see you back. Uh, Hugh Frazier. Hey, Hugh, how's it going? Leanne Barterson. Great to see you. Cher, it's fabulous to see you as well. Oh. Hi, Timas. Random Pieces. Great to see you. Rhiannon McCook. Uh, first time catching us live. So, hey, you know what? There's always Welcome. more to come. Keep on Welcome. coming back. Jazz Naz Gaming. Great to see you in the chat. Um, let's see. Oh, there's Dr. Silkman again. Catnit, uh, who made the wonderful intro for this channel. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Uh, yeah, it's really, really awesome. And it, it's danger music, you know. It's going to set Andy. <laughs> Andy's going to be uh, set off now. Yep. <laughs> uh, another one of our new mods, Kay. It is so fabulous to have you on our team. And welcome to the chat and on the panel. Uh, foul Play is here. Uh, Neverly is pulling the strings for Foul Play today. Uh, and my West Coast homie, Grand Moss, great to see you. Uh, just Rhonda's in the chat. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I don't recall. Cherie, my soul twin, how are you? And she's also on the panel with us. T1, it was a fabulous, fabulous intro and MLR to you as well um welcome let's see um sheila hawkins i think i might have missed you a minute ago i'm sorry uh ronald cass from the missouri ozark great to have you here 
Pete Moss, hello to you as well. Um, Charlotte Dowling, Sheila Hawks, random pieces. Yes, like Doc said, we are going to continue talking about Cam just to complete the rebuttals that we started. So Nan's Life 7, how are you? It's great to see you back. And um, thinking I might have, JJ Falk Jr. Hey, JJ, it's great to have you. And Scooby the Dog. Uh, Welcome to Scooby. B-O-L, uh, I be, be on the lookout. Uh, $1 in the cuss jar for Saprakop. All proceeds go to me. No, listen. <laughs> there's there's i have a we're going to debate that um but yeah with me and scoot or me and sapper and if alice pops on a bit later you know yeah this could be a swear fest we'll see uh <laughs> and um let's see i think i think, I think we got, I got it everybody. oh something to talk about great to see you welcome and awesome. i think that's it Awesome, awesome. Welcome, everybody. Well, look, um, uh, unless there are any comments, Jack61, did you have a quick comment? Uh, no, sorry. I, I got thrown out of StreamYard. I don't know what happened. It's just like, uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to go between the YouTube uh, uh, screen and uh, the StreamYard uh, page, and it's just like, no, no, you can't do that. And then it just, just threw me out and said something went wrong. Well, no joke. <laughs> anyway. we oh, what? Yeah. oh yeah we never left it's just me i just i'm the only one who got thrown out so it, 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 nothing got missed but uh i will have to load each individual clip separately now because oh, i already had them preloaded cool. yeah because it threw, you know it doesn't save them for you right Rhonda? yeah that's right yeah that's irritating oh, but it's not a problem it's fine it's, it's fine no, no, no issue no hassles all right guys look We'll make a start and welcome everyone. It's great to have everybody here. Um, so as you can see from the title slide here, uh, we're going to be continuing our rebuttal. And the two episodes that we're looking at is episode number one, which is entitled An Unraveling Narrative, and episode two, uh, Sharing Wives. And so what we've done is we've taken a series of clips and we're going to be discussing them. But before we do that, guys, um, there's a couple of warnings that we want to put up. Um, Jack61, do you have the uh, next slide? Yeah. So just a general disclaimer. Um, what we're going to be doing is showing clips from convicting a murderer. They're only short clips. I think the longest one is about um, two minutes or so. Uh, and we're doing this for research purposes. And the important thing, guys, is that these are just our opinions, right? That's the most important thing. These are just our opinions, the comments that we're going to make. Um, so we're going to be showing these clips. Um, so Jack61, if we can have the next slide, please. Um, because of the subject matter that we're going to be talking about today, um, there could be uh, trigger warnings. So we want to put that uh, right up front, um, please. If you find this material distressing that we're talking about, um, you know, uh, please leave, right? If you find this very, very distressing, and it is, the, some of the subject matter that we'll be talking about today is very distressing. Now, I've tried my very best to get the least offensive clips in Convicting a Murderer, uh, episode number one and episode number two. But the subject matter is pretty strong, it's pretty confronting, and we need to discuss it, right? That's very important. But before we do that, guys, I noticed that in chat there's a lot of new people and there are those that maybe have not really seen uh, Convicting a Murderer and there's probably some that haven't even seen Making a Murderer. So I want to do a little recap, a quick recap, to put everybody on the same page. Jack61, can we have a look at the very first slide, please? By the way, if, if anybody does get triggered, uh, make sure you let Sean Reck and Davey Wire know because it's their fault. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Jack61, the very first slide is slide A. Um, do you have that one? It's, uh, yeah, further down. It's slide A, the one with uh, Riccardi and Demos. Yep, slide A. Yep. 
Yep, we'll just wait for slide A. Um, are you able to put that full screen, slide A? We'll just wait. Uh, sorry, Doc. I was sitting here talking muted. Give me just one no, second. No, no, no hassles. Okay. I know that sometimes StreamYard can be a little bit tricky. It's a slow day. We'll just wait for that. And Susan just joined us. Ah, welcome, Susan. Hello. <laughs> welcome. Had, uh, some tech problems. Can you hear me? <laughs> Yep, that's the it. Yes, it can. Okay. Oh my God. So this is. Yep, we can hear you, Susan. So this is slide A, and I just want to bring everybody uh, up to speed. So essentially, what we've got here, um, as we all know, uh, both uh, Laura Riccardi and Moira Demos, uh, many years ago, uh, f filmed the trial of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. Uh, and it took them a long time to put Making a Murderer out. Um, and uh, these are the creators of Making a Murderer. Uh, and when Making a Murderer was released, uh, it really was an overnight sensation. And if you have a look at the slide, which is down the bottom on the left-hand side, you can see that millions of people had watched Making a Murderer, right? Right. Uh, and uh, it was a very, very popular show. A lot of people binged, watched it. Now, I want to ask a question to the panel before we continue. Um, just a simple yes or no, and also people in chat. After you had watched Making a Murderer, right, this season number one, which were 10 episodes, did you think that Stephen and Brendan were innocent or guilty as charged? Uh, just Rhonda, what were your impressions after watching Ma'am? Innocent or guilty? Um, you know, I guess I'm going to have to say I believed they were innocent because when I watched the last episode, because I hadn't been really following the case, when I watched the last episode, I, I expected to be seeing that they were going to be getting out of prison, or at least Brendan was. And when they weren't, I just was like, I was freaking out, like, no fucking way. There's no way these guys can still be in prison. At least this kid, this kid should not still be in prison. So I must have believed they were innocent. Okay. Um, I don't remember necessarily having a, a you know, a, a bold thought of that, but I guess I did. Okay. Interesting. Thank you, uh, Just Rhonda. What about yourself, Jack61? What were your impressions after watching Man? Well, uh, you know, I said it before. I, I really thought that Brendan got screwed and, and was innocent. He got drugged into a, he just got drugged into it. Of course, at the time, you know, we didn't know really anything. So, um, and then, but Stephen, I, I really didn't know. Now, I, I really didn't know. I, I was undecided and wanted to know more about both cases, actually. So, that's kind of how I felt. I did feel pretty strongly that, that the prosecutor had stepped way over the line. The, the, the press conference I knew was wrong. <laughs> and even back then, I had, was nowhere near as deep as I am now into legal stuff. But even then, I knew prosecutors don't do that for a reason. So Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Jack61. What about you, Sapacop? What were your impressions after watching Ma'am? Uh, it, truthfully, I, I, I was undecided. Um, I I had seen enough to have some serious questions about what was going on or what had happened. I definitely wanted to know more. Um, you know, ha being being former law enforcement, a lot of the things that I saw that the cops did and didn't do did not make sense, did not jibe with what an actual police investigation looks like. So uh, I I, I, def I had a lot more questions. Um, that, that's kind of where I was. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Sapper Cop. Um, what about you? I don't recall. What were your impressions? 
I just wasn't sure. Um, I kind of thought they were innocent, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, what about you, Katie? What were your impressions? I, I, I had the feeling that they were innocent, but I was more concerned with um, the way the investigation <laughs> didn't happen. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, yep. It's always disturbing when, when you see that they're not following, um, following Pro the facts person. looking for the truth. Um, but like Rhonda, I expected in the end that they were probably going to be released. So I was shocked at the end as well. Interesting. Thank you very much, Katie. Uh, who's next? Is it Susan? Susan. Is it me? I can't yes. see. Yeah, um, I can't see. Yeah, much like Kay, I thought very, that very likely they were innocent after what I'd seen and very suspicious of law enforcement for sure. And that's really what drove me to go online and find out more information. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Susan. And uh, Neverly, what were your impressions? I was shocked and in disbelief. I... Uh was just i had tons of questions tons 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 i was so perplexed if i had to choose innocent or guilty i would say innocent but as i said i had so many questions that uh, eventually i found foul play and uh read it and so forth read books definitely got me curious but i just couldn't believe that uh that was it that was the end of the story you know that they were both in prison for life. Yeah. Interesting. Very, very interesting. How about yourself? Yeah. Um, well, I'm here in Australia, so I'm a long way away from America and uh, the American uh, criminal justice system. But I must uh, admit I was uh, completely shocked. Um, I'd never really seen a documentary like this before. The one that came closest was The Staircase, right? That, that was very similar in which a group of... Um, investigative journalists and reporters were following the case. Um, I thought this was a drama. I thought this couldn't be real. I thought they were actors, but I was shocked to discover that, yeah, it was being filmed in real time. Uh, my impressions were there was something bizarre in the case. Things were not panning out as they should, like Sapokop. And um, I thought, wow, the forensic evidence doesn't stack up. There's something really weird here. Uh, I had no doubt at all about the innocence of Brendan Dassey. No problems at all. Um, my impressions back then were if Stephen had committed this murder, it could not have been the way the state panned it out to be, right? And like you guys, I wanted to find out more. I got, uh, I had a lot of questions on my mind to ask. Um, but if I could just ask, uh, for the guys that have been around much longer than me, back then, uh, as the case was happening in real time, were there people who thought, yep, Stephen and Brendan were definitely guilty? Yes. I can okay. answer that. I got involved Jackson. and read it. Yeah, I got involved and read it. Um, let's see, I, I watched the series on the 20th of December, it was two days after it came out, I binged it, immediately went to Reddit, found the man, Nam Sub. And, and there was already sub, you know, a few people talking and, and rumbling. It, it wasn't, but it, it wasn't like it is, or like it uh, happened within two weeks, uh, 10 days probably. There were those that felt like that Stephen and Brennan were exactly where they belonged. And I'm going to tell you right now, that some of those very people are still involved. Right. Yeah, some so, of those very people are in the documentary. <laughs> yes. Ab absolutely. And, you know, that brings about, uh, I ask again a question today on Reddit. I, I put a pretty long comment on this uh, state advocate, Gilter. You know, if you're so convinced that Stephen and Brendan are in the right place, why are you here? Why are you, why are you guys always, have always been involved in being moderators in this sub of a documentary that you freaking hate? 
why all the effort to come after truthers trying to share information and documentation to figure out more about the case? And that's, they have done that. I can prove it. I can prove it. Correct. This has been Correct. going on since this has been going on since. Uh, well, actually, before the the um, documentary hit on December 18th on Susan's birthday, the sub was actually cre- the MAM sub was actually created about mid November, about a month prior when the trailer hit. And uh, there were already, I mean, a lot of those mods, um, probably all but one. There might be still be one left that's left there because they got in so much trouble over the their inaction of what they allowed to happen in that sub. It was a, it was a disaster. It, it, yes. It, 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 and, you know, I, I, I don't mean to ramble. I, I just there were those that definitely felt for sure Stephen and Brendan were guilty. They went off after about um, it, it wasn't quite a month. It was mid-January 2016. Uh, they created the sub and pardon my French. This was the name of it originally. Stephen yep. Avery is guilty as fuck. Right. <laughs> Reddit, Reddit made them change it or it had to be a not safe for work sub. And that creates other additional problems for traffic. So they, I guess they allowed them to change the name, whatever. Um, but then there was about, I don't know, 50 or 60. that said they were leaving the ma'am sub and never coming back. Well, of course that was a lie. Part of them were mods in that sub. It was so dumb. That's yeah. so anyway. That people that it was this one of the subs was made even before it came out, so they weren't convinced either way by the by the documentary. Is that what you were saying? No, making a murder. The making murder, the trailer hit on Netflix uh, in November of 2015. Oh, okay. And this this guy on on Reddit had been around for years. He created this the MAM sub. He was the first. Um, there are others that tried, I'm sure, but he created the one that really blew up. And then, of course, right. you know, I'm sure pe- there, there are places you can go look for mods that will come and help you moderate your your sub. <laughs> and uh, so there were several guilters that got involved in that and has stayed involved. There are guilters on it right now. One of yeah. them actually is in the documentary yeah. quite a bit. So so the important point here, guys, just here in the feedback, um, is that making a murderer didn't brainwash, didn't brainwash everyone, right? There were people, individuals who thought that Stephen and Brendan were guilty, uh, committed the rape, committed the murder, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there wasn't a 100%. Yeah, the innocent, right? Clearly, there was a mixture in the community. Even after watching Making a Murderer, there were people that believed in their guilt. Correct. That's the impression. That's right. I get. Yeah, and there was another uh, um, web page. Um, oh God, what was the name of it? Susan, help me out here. Web. No. Web Jinx sleuth. On it. Web sleuth. Yes. There was a art there. There was a web. It's like a forum, basically on a web page, with different cases that people comment on, it. and it was pretty blowed up too. I mean, even stuff from two thousand five and six were were, were were there, and then of course, Mam came out, and it, you know, it really blew up. So, yep, correct, correct. So, uh, I mean, for me, what I did after watching Making a Murderer, I, I basically went online myself. I didn't go to Reddit or any of those um, uh, type of uh, discussion groups. I mainly looked at YouTube, and I was very fortunate. I encountered uh, people like um, Eric Cozy, uh, Paul Capaldi, uh, Purple Plex, uh, Rubber Ducky, uh, and eventually joined Rubber Ducky's team, and uh, we were able to get together with a lot of people, some uh, who are part of foul play, to discuss the case further. And I realized that I had a lot, a lot to learn and uh, to ask a lot of uh, deep questions about uh, the case. And uh, over many, many years now that we're part of foul play, um, what really impresses me is that we try and keep speculation to a minimum. We say when we're speculating and we refer to the uh, primary documents, case documents. Well, lo and behold, um, we now have convicting a murderer. Uh, and if we go back to the same picture, 
you know that the spokesperson, the hostess, uh, is Candace Owens. And I must admit, I really didn't know very much about uh, her background, uh, the type of uh, work that she's done. Um, I did a little bit of reading a couple of days ago, and oh my God, she is a very, very uh, controversial person, very divisive, uh, straight up front, doesn't mince with her words. And uh, I must admit, I found having Candace as the spokesperson uh, for a counter documentary, a rather odd or bizarre, um, that she would uh, take on a project like this, like Convicting a Murderer. And the final person I want to introduce, uh, as you can see, is Brenda Schuller. And Brenda Schuller, uh, as you can see here, she's the uh, so called producer, researcher, she's also the uh, so called fact checker uh, in the series. And um, I could tell you that uh, Brenda Schuller uh, interviewed uh, some members of the Foul Play team, <laughs> me included, about uh, three years ago, and uh, was a very, very interesting exercise. Right, guys? Does anyone have any comments? Uh, just speak out because I, I can't see whether you're muted or not. Who would like to comment? Well, I know, uh, you know, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't part of the crew uh, when Brenda did all her interviews, but... I remember way back in 2018 and 2019 when Sean was commenting on Twitter about the whole case or about the show, and they both presented it as a neutral, unbiased, you know, just telling the right story thing was what the documentary was going to be about. And they stuck to that for a long time, never wavering from it. Um, Obviously, now come to find out that that's the exact opposite. Uh, that's just what we were told. Sir. That's what yeah. we were told, Saber. Yeah, and, and, and so every everything everything out of their mouth was a lie. So that 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 automatically told me that they're, you know, they're nothing nothing they said or did or presented in the show was to be trusted, which it wasn't. Um, and that 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 spelled it out for me right right off the bat. Uh, when when you can't even present yourself factually uh, or honestly, then. You, you have no credibility. See, they yeah, even went uh, as far as changing uh, the title. They yeah. dropped a murderer and, and said that they changed it to just convicting. And that was a lie. I believe that was a total lie uh, to get truthers more open willing to talk to, Will willing yeah. to, talk to them. Yeah. Yep. Correct. Yeah, to me, but, at least was, making a murderer had a, an agenda. It was the injustice system, you know, justice or injustice system and uh, fair trials and so forth. And once again, I'm going to say this is not about Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. It could have been anybody in their position. But with Cam, I think that it was definitely misled to be nice. I don't want to say manipulated. I feel like we, Foul Play, got manipulated into this uh, story um, that, you know, they want a balanced approach, they're looking for the truth and everything else. And then at the end, as you guys see, it has nothing to do with that. It was really yeah. they were following Kratz's book. And had we known that ahead of time, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty. I don't know if we would agree, maybe still so. I can't say, but yeah. at least we would have thought about it more. We really, I can okay. speak for myself and for foul play. I think we honestly uh, approach it wholeheartedly thinking that it's going to be a healthy debate. Little did we know that it was nothing, you know, anything but. Yeah, I, I believe, um, th thank you, Neville. I believed uh, we were used for a purpose. Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure Brenda was actually quite prepared for us um, uh, as a team. Um, I don't think she was actually quite prepared for the fact that we actually knew a lot of our material. I don't think someone like Brenda would now in, uh, interview us now, um, considering we've done at least two to 300 additional podcasts uh, after we were interviewed uh, three years ago. Jack61, did you have a comment, sir? Yeah, I do. And, um, you know, people can take this as whatever. But another massive difference between making a murderer and convicting a murderer, making a murderer didn't have a narrator. No. It was all footage of news or 
trial or some activity, um, but there was no narrator. Great and point. That, and what Great happens point. in convict? Yeah, what happens in convicting murder? You have people that are guilters trying to convince you that Stephen did it. And and you can't tell me that doesn't have an effect on people because it does. I've said it before, and I'll probably say it some more by the time we get done with Cam doing this rebuttal stuff. Uh, that was a part that that had to be part of the goal. It had to be. They had to lay this out uh, from the beginning, and and they knew that they couldn't mimic what Ma'am did in regards to just showing news footage and and trial stuff because the the material is just not there. It's just not. So then. It, they get in Earl and Candy with their great big axe to grind and their grinding machine and let them just have the platform. God damn it. I mean, come on. I'm, I mean, seriously. Anyway, sorry about that. No, not um, at all. Yeah. But Separate. I mean, I, I think it's a No, no, I, I'm, I'm about done. I think it's a huge difference uh, from the approach uh, and how um, they use Brenda and, and uh, you know, there's I, there's actually what six of them in there, uh, six or seven doc. Isn't that what we talked about? Something like that. Yeah. That they scattered throughout, but mainly Brenda, Candace Owens, uh, the the guy Rich. Yeah, uh, puzzled we'll, by it all. We'll introduce them. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, show you. I'll introduce them all because there it's, you go. It's, actually, it's actually you make a very good point, and that's why I'm spending. I want to spend at least half an hour with this introduction. Because one, once you see the main characters involved in convicting a murderer, you'll understand the themes that were developed throughout yeah. the series. There was a deliberate intention, right? We'll analyze it after. I mean, it didn't take me too long to realize what they were doing. There's how, no doubt. There's no doubt at all about that, Doc. No doubt. And how we as foul play, we were we were in a very difficult category for them to to put us in a bucket and uh, that we'll talk about. Sepakop, did you have a comment, sir? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, after after watching the f even just the first couple of episodes of, of Cam, it was, it was quite apparent that it felt to me like there were, there were a number, number of different agendas. Uh, Brenda Schuler is, is out for attention, out for some kind of publicity, to make a name for herself in, in some form or fashion. Um, and, and she failed miserably. Sean Reck, on the other hand, seemed to me to have a, a, some, some level. Well, Hugh, Hugh Frazier asked if, if Brenda was, uh, motivated by hate. I don't think Brenda was, but to me, it felt like Sean was because the message being put across against both Netflix and Laura and Mora were unmistakable. It was the 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 hate was spilling off the screen when it came yeah. to those three entities, yeah. um, and then everybody else in there: Rich Donovan, Puzzled, uh, Super Pickle, and Dan O'Donnell. For Christ's sakes, they're all just there to get their to get their five minutes, yeah. and ninety percent of them didn't even even know basic facts of the case, uh, and and I still doubt Brenda's. Um, knowledge on the case as well, even though she supposedly has binders and binders full of stuff. But um, yeah, the, the the agenda was clear, and it, it wasn't to find fact. It wasn't to you know solve the case or, or anything like that. It was simply to to tear down Stephen, tear down Netflix, and tear down uh, Laura and Mora. That's yep. right. That's it. Yep. Yep. And so also, sorry, Susan. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Sean Rex, Sean Rex partner. What's his name? Andy Hale. He's well known. He's well known as a law enforcement um, cheerleader, Ad, ad advocate. Yeah, yep. advocate. Yep. Yeah, and um, I think that had a lot to do with yep. um, yep. why they chose this story. Yep. Uh, and uh, just just before we uh, if we can put slide A back up again, Jack sixty one. I think I want to make an important point, right? Now, I'm going to ask a question, and I want a yes or no, because this is very fundamental and also very fundamental uh, for people in chat. I want to ask a question. On the bottom left-hand corner, you can see that Netflix was a massively popular show. Massive. 
It had a huge impact throughout the world. It exposed, I believe, uh, the injustices of the criminal justice system, as Neville pointed out. This was more than just a story of Stephen Avery, Brendan Dassey, Teresa Horbach, and their respective families. It had an overarching uh, uh, approach. I want to ask this question. I just want a yes or no. If making a murderer was a dud, would we see convicting a murderer today? Just no. Rhonda. Yes no. or no? Just Rhonda. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no. Jack 61. No, absolutely not. Sapper Cop. Nope. I, I don't recall. No. Katie. No. Neverly. I'm so sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. I squirreled. If, if, if ma'am wasn't as popular as it was, would we have convicting a murderer today? No. No. Heck no. Susan? No, they're making money on the tailcoats of Man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's Susan. exactly what I was going to say. They're riding the coattails of ma'am and looking for a payout. Yep. And, you and, know uh, what? This is uh, perfect mm -hmm. for Kratz and his uh, self-described uh, personality disorder of narcissism, which is you make progress during chaos. You climb the ladders during chaos. And that was confirmed with those emails between him and Brenda. So, yeah. Correct. Uh, and uh, my opinion is there's no way we would see uh, convicting a murderer uh, if making a murderer wasn't as popular, which goes to show, and I believe that there was an actual argument or an exchange between Brenda and also um, Ken Kratz in that they needed to make sure that MAM 2 was made to keep up the popularity so they could basically, uh, you know, do a rebuttal themselves and Ken Kratz can become famous by writing a book. So it goes to show what is the motivation of Sean Reck? What is the motivation of Brenda Schuller? What's the motivation of Candace? Guys, if you've got a comment in, in, uh, on the panel, please just say, cause I can't see your I, microphone. He's I, I have a comment. comment. I've got a comment. And I think uh, Saffer and, and you and probably everyone here understand that um, this seething jealousy over the success of making a murder, there was absolutely no doubt at all. You could hear it in Kratz and the number of interviews that he did after making a murder hit. He was mad as hell because, you know, he and him and Griesbach did a, um, a really, really terrible documentary back in 2014. It's awful and it flopped like 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 a dead fish on the side of the road it was terrible uh, you know and uh, for for crass uh and just knowing his narciss narcissistic ways it, this brings us about to the colburn lawsuit and the involvement of brenda with yes. colburn and Griesbach, which was had to be tied to convicting a murderer because colburn is, pro is profiled quite a bit throughout the series here we've seen it and i Correct. i think they expected him to win that's my yes, my did. thought right yes they and did. that didn't and that didn't happen at all <laughs> judge <laughs> ludwig they did that the leah walker she destroyed them the netflix lawyers she absolutely is sharp one of the sharpest lawyers i've ever read her, her work yeah. oh my Correct. god ronda 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 will agree i know yep. she will yep so everyone everyone yeah, is absolutely. Into yeah, everyone essentially is in agreement that we wouldn't yeah. see Cam if it wasn't because Ma'am was so successful, That's right. right? Because when you think about it, right, both Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey, they've been sentenced by 12 of their peers. They're in prison. They're in a cell. They're likely going to die in prison, both of them, unless something miraculously happens, which means what is the purpose of Cam? What's the real purpose of CAM? Sapakop, do you have a comment, sir? Um, you know, the 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 show landing at Daily Wire kind of kind of answers that for us. 
um, because Daily Wire and and the folks within Daily Wire, whom whom I actually respect quite a bit, um, I follow Daily Wire, I follow Ben Shapiro, um, yes. most most of the folks in that. So they 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 have a very niche audience. Um, they're they're on the right. They're you know very anti lefty. If, if if you think of the political spectrum, that's kind of what I'm referring to. Um, they're very pro law enforcement. So when that landed there and, and given kind of what we had found out before that point about what was really going on with the show, it, it made complete sense. But it also tells you something about the show, how badly the show was going to be when it took so long as it did and then landed where it did. Um, nobody else wanted it. Daily Wire was, was like a last ditch. So it lands there. So that that tells you that it's going to be a very pro law enforcement show because that's where it ended up, and the whole purpose of Candace Owens being the spokesperson was for name recognition. That's it, um, because in in the Daily Wire umbrella, she is the hot firebrand. She's the one that is like the 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 guard dog, the the, the pit bull that goes after you know Black Lives Matter and. Uh, stuff like that. So that that was her purpose in the show, um, in in trying to to make it make something. Um, but yeah, it's it's absolutely. Uh, and I totally lost my train of thought there. That, that that was the agenda as as I understood it, based on all those factors. Think, you know, I, I'll really, I'll, yeah, I, I'm, I'd really like to know. Uh, Cyber Cop brought up a good point. I'd really like to know who all of these various platforms actually viewed convicting a murderer. I'm talking about like Netflix and, you know, Hulu and, and all these, I really like to know, and we'll never see the list, I'm sure, but, yep. and how it ended up at the daily wire. That's a great point. Cyber. Yeah. Well, uh, James Crane had a also, excuse me, Susan had a great <laughs> point. He said that ma'am was made. It was a low budget production. So, what they did with as little money they self-financed or whatever they, it, in other words it wasn't as big of a project as it was cam and they put out just facts and there wasn't a narrator this is not my words this is all what's coming yeah, from chat right. i forgot who said it there was no narrator so it was just like these are the facts right where cam was the other way around yes they put some factoids over there but they had that great great narrator who actually i think it backfired on them and uh, the difference between ma'am and cam i think that uh, all the money that they have spent on their agenda which which you dr silkman just pointed out what is their true agenda because this can be which it discuss, which we will discuss yeah. great yeah i think i think i've worked I, it out oh, Susan. i think that was simply defending the verdict backing the state, keeping them in prison. That was their agenda. True. Yeah, they definitely did nothing to help look at the truth in the matter or to ask hard questions like we are. We are actually asking hard questions. Stephen and Brandon are in prison already. So if they're truly guilty, we have nothing to worry about, you know, they're safe there. Everybody's safe from there. But is that the case? And this is why we're here. So it will be interesting to see which way they're going to go in CAM 2. So we're going to hold on tight. But the but, I'm sure we're going to see some familiar faces, huh? I'm being we, silly. We, yeah. we might see some familiar faces. <laughs> Susan, did you have another comment? Um, I did. And I lost my train of thought. Sorry. Okay. Well, Sorry. so another thing about I, I've got one more comment, and I'll, I'll hush talk and let you move on. No, no another thing about another thing about Cam was it was so much of it was conclusionary. They weren't asking what? questions, as Neverly just said. They were at conclusions, even if they came by with hearsay, nothing to back it up at all. Like all this shit we heard from Earl and Candy, the son here talking about all this stuff with absolutely, you know, we'll get into it later about this fire and what Candy said. I'm like. You know, we're all just blown away. Like, what did you just say that you've never said that before? That was fire was so big that I thought the house was going to melt. Really? <laughs> correct, correct. But you you have to admit, you have to admit though, 
that um, convicting a murderer already had a blueprint in which to work. Ma'am. Yes. So it's pretty obvious because, look, I've done, I've done drama, I've done English, I've done all these things, analyses. I could see exactly what they did. In the uh, lawsuit, uh, Colburn's lawsuit, Colburn cited all these factors, including spooky music, which making a murderer used, and he felt that it destroyed him, his character, his personality, he received death threats, et cetera, et cetera. Convicting a murderer used exactly the same elements, right? We've seen it. And they did it on steroids. So what they did is they picked and choose the most important dramatic elements of making a murderer and simply threw them back, right, including spooky music. Uh, Sepakop, did you have a comment? Oh, I, I was just going to say, yeah, they, they, you, you always accuse somebody of the actions that you're, you yourself are already doing. So, you know, yes. ev every, ev everything that they accused ma'am of doing, they did in spades uh, to, yes. to the nth like degree. The emotional thing. You know how they said, oh, you know, truthers got all emotional and they base their conclusions, uh, you know, upon those emotions. Look what they did in the first four episodes. They wanted to anger people with creating this like woo big bad wolf, which we knew he wasn't a great guy to begin with. And uh, it wasn't relevant in the court anyways, because you can't use that like prior bad acts. But uh, they spent four hours. That's just on screen time, let alone, you know, how many hours did they actually spend compiling, filming and compiling that together? Oh, correct. Are you saying they they hijacked amygdalas in the first? <laughs> <laughs> if they had any, I, I think what Cam did also is just to, um, to show the character of this guy, Stephen. They showed his character and convicted him on that. Alone. Correct. Correct. Oh, uh, now. Uh, I agree, Susan, but you have to remember, right, millions of people uh, watched Making a Murderer, millions, uh, and a lot of people, I'm not sure whether it was millions, they believed in the innocence of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey. Along comes Convicting a Murderer, and Convicting a Murderer is more like a shock -umentary. It's a shock -umentary. It's yes. basically designed to take you out of your state of um, being hijacked, your amygdala being hijacked, and they're going to reinstate your amygdala, right? They're not going to hijack it. They're going to hand it back. They want you to see common sense and logic. So their approach very much is the total destruction of the two filmmakers, Netflix, and all its supporters. In other words, us. So their aim, their overarching aim was to convince and convert as many people that believed in their innocence to now head towards guilt, right? So their approach is very much, we're going to show you how bad Stephen is. Now, remember Jack 61 when we were interviewed uh, by Brenda, right? We thought it was going to be a cordial discussion talking about the murder case. Let's yep. talk about the merits of the murder investigation. What went right? What went wrong? No, no, no. Brenda dragged us back pre in the in the mid eighties, talking about Stephen, his character, what he did, the cap burning incidents, the robbery. Oh, did you remember? Oh, did you know? Oh, did you know? And we're thinking, wait a minute. He's been charged. He's been convicted. He got fined and he went to prison. I think he learned his lessons for the for the things that he did. We were here to discuss with Brenda the murder case. Right, guys? Was that your impression? Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. And when we kept on being dragged back to the uh, early childhood or early uh, adulthood of uh, Stephen, we're thinking, wait a minute, what, what is Brenda trying to achieve here? And now, after watching Cam, 
it's pretty obvious. We're regarded, the foul play team, Mineshock, Paul Capaldi, uh, and others are regarded as, <laughs> as supporters, truthers. Their aim is to shut us down. That's the impression, the strong impression I get. And it's very interesting, and we'll talk about it, how you see in the series people convert, people flip from innocence to guilt. So it's like a journey that these individuals have been on. We're a danger because we are looking at the minutia of the case. We're looking at the documents, the facts. We're asking hard questions. We get asked hard questions. I have a feeling that they want us to go away, super cop. What about yourself? Yeah, they. Well, I, I their, their their logic escapes me. Um, there, there's not any of us on this panel or anyone in in the the quote unquote truth or community who are going to get Stephen or Brendan out. We, there, there's nothing we can do to do that. That's Correct. the legal system. That's Casey's job. Um, none of us are lawyers, you know, uh, unless, unless somebody, you know, it, it ends up getting some kind of miraculous FOIA request that, that breaks the case. We're just, we're just commenters. We're just, uh, you know, bystanders on the side, watching something go by and giving our opinions on it. That's, that, that's our whole role here. And, and to think that they have to generate this entire PR campaign to try to counter that for some reason it just blows my mind. So I, I really don't understand. But the, the other part of it is they 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 don't know their audience. And I and I've told that to, to Sean over and over again on yes. Twitter is they 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 want to uh, paint the entire truth of the community with this broad generalized brush that we're all soulless and we're we're backing a rapist and we must hate cops and, and all this and that. Uh, it couldn't it couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, as, as you can tell by my, my handle, I'm a military vet and former law enforcement. I am all kinds of back the blue. I, I, I will back the blue usually above all else until it, you know, until it's shown that it's there, there isn't a reason to do so, which unfortunately is the case here. Um, it, it wasn't until I dug into the documents, started reading the reports, uh, started going through the ledgers. And and started reading uh, um, uh, opinions by others that that I finally came to the conclusion that no, what what law enforcement did in this case does not jive with any other actual criminal investigation and how those things go. That's what convinced me, not a documentary. So the 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 fact that they they have failed to account for someone like me in their you know in their in their brush, um, and there's many more than just me that are that are in that in that pool. Uh, unjustly placed. So that's that's why they're going to fail because they just didn't know their audience. I think so. I think so. And um, I agree 100% Sapakop and I respect your background, uh, your expertise and what you've done. And I think your voice is very, very powerful as well. Um, but Brenda, I don't think was also prepared for us. Um, we actually had read the literature. We had we had done our due diligence. Uh, we have spent a long time foying documents. But Susan, do you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I also very much respect um, law enforcement, honest law Correct. enforcement, Correct. Um, and appreciate the tough job that they have and uh, the bravery they have and what they do. Um, you know on a daily basis. I respect them very much, Correct. but <clears throat> there are dishonest people in every profession. I don't care what you're talking about, every profession. Right. And those people I do not respect. Correct. If in, I could just if, add something too, uh, in regards to Cam, sorry, I had to step away. Uh, for me personally, it felt like I was going on a ride in a car with a blindfold on. I had no clue where this was, where we were going with this cam and recording once we figured out that actually it had nothing to do with the reality or actually our perception and expectations or what we were told. We were, you know, we were approached with this idea, as I mentioned several times and other people have too, you know, with a balanced approach and a healthy debate and uh, looking for the truth. 
when somebody tells you we want the truth, you're going to assume they're kind of on the same along the same line of your yes. thinking because if you're a guilter like they are militant guilters what's their truth the guys are pronounced guilty by the court state of wisconsin okay. they're in jail so just whenever they say we're looking for the truth i don't understand that part correct 100 percent correct so um my, my final question to the panel before we go on to the next slide do you think convicting a murderer has been good or bad for law enforcement in general? Has it changed your opinion on them? Just Rhonda, has it been good or bad? Uh, has convicting a murderer been Yeah, convicting a murderer been good or bad for law enforcement? I... You know, I don't know if I can really answer that. Um, I because I just believe everything about Cam was just so antagonistic and fake and 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 unreal, and, and that includes um, everything that you know that the main players in law enforcement did in in the case to begin with. Those officers, those law enforcement officers who were part of, because I don't believe every single person, every single law enforcement in the investigation had a hand in, in, in doing anything nefarious. I don't believe that. Agreed. Agreed. I don't think it, we needed, they needed very many to do it. It didn't really take a lot. In fact, a lot muddies up the program a little bit. Yes. You know. Yes. So, so I mean, I guess, I guess that really just it kind of depends on where you stand, uh, whether you're a truther or a guilter. If you believe that these guys are guilty, then Cam was wonderful for for law enforcement. But if you believe, you know, I mean, my experience with law enforcement goes far beyond making a murder or Cam, and yes. uh, you know, what what they what what the ones in that were in law enforcement did during the investigation, the nefariousness parts, they're horrible. They make all, they're the ones who make the entire group look bad, even though we know that's <laughs> not every cop is a bad cop. I right. argue that there are more good cops than there are bad, of course. But they're, those are the ones that make you look at all cops as being bad. Yeah, I don't know. I, I can't really say for sure. I think it depends on okay. what you were on to begin with. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, thank you, just Rhonda. Jack sixty one. What what do you think uh, Cam did for law enforcement, good or bad? Uh, I think that uh, because of the connection to the Colburn case, I, I think it's really kind of bad um, because I just think about his second amendment complaint and when he made all these fantastical claims about what making a murderer did to him and his family yes, and caused his to yeah and then even further he added to his already several different accountings of the license plate call he added another element to it yes and, and for me for me doc it, it i'm not saying every cop i'm i'm just saying that i, I just think it overall it, it hurts them as a group you just you don't do these kinds of things if you're trying to be truthful. You just don't. But what what is remarkable, right? Are things actually calmed down prior to Cam? You have to admit things settled down. The yep. courts slowing down Kathleen Zona. Things had died down, settled down. If you're from a law enforcement perspective, you're going, thank God they're not talking about us anymore. All yes. of a sudden. Convicting a murderer comes out and all the wounds are reopened again. We're yeah, scared. I agree. Yep. And they must be thinking, oh, my God, you've put us in the light again. Yep. Right? And I, I do believe that uh, the producers of Convicting a Murderer thought that Colburn was going to win his oh. civil suit against oh, the yeah. murderer and go, see, we were right. 
<laughs> okay, interesting. Supercop, what did you think about Cam? Good or bad for law enforcement office, officers, sir? Uh, I, I don't think it had any effect for law enforcement in general um, because good good cops will always overcome bad cops. The, the, the number of bad cops is such a small, small percentage that there's no way you know they, they could ever overcome all the good work done by all the all the honest badge holders so yes. i i don't think it it had any effect in general however i think it had a detrimental effect for for those law enforcement involved in this case because we you know in in again in reading all the reports um uh, you know looking at the ledgers looking at the trial testimonies all of that and looking at all some a few other cases like the, the ricky hoxhetler case that these exact same officers were involved in and right. seeing the actions they took in that case there's a pattern of behavior that that you, that you can't overlook um so we we already knew they had had told lies or or had been untruthful and now when cam comes out they just further expand on those untruths making it worse for them and that's and that's all of them that's andy that's that's fact bender um Weigert wasn't even in the documentary yep. that that should tell you something yep. um and all of that so for for general law enforcement no effect at all for the folks involved in the case uh, i think it was i think it did them a a, a disservice yeah we we're not being in the the series it was very noticeable to me and there had to be a reason for that we won't get into it yeah but, neither yeah. pagel neither pagel no. as well no. interesting interesting well i have Kate, a question uh, nivelling i'm sorry i have a question jack remember how you would foia do a foia request for certain things and we himself would say um sorry cannot uh, approve this because it's still an open case yeah he he pulled out a couple of times sometimes he would say and he would try to get away with oh well it's uh, you know the, the evidence is sealed he's trying to say that the court sealed it but that wasn't true at all the box was sealed with tape so he, he did he did a lot of things that just weren't cool at all. I mean, um, a recording I wanted, still trying to get, you know, he says, uh, well, you know, it's got to be sent out to be converted to digital. Come yeah, back but my after, point after, is, Yeah, go ahead. My point is that, he, didn't he say that it was still an open case or the investigation is still open or something like that? Um, Somebody I think said I had, that. I think, I think a couple of replies, maybe... Okay. Uh, when Casey had filed something, see when when something's been filed, like Casey filed it, and it opens the it, it opens the case back up. It's it they can use that as a legal excuse because they, they may have to reply. So anything you get could detrimentally affect their case, so they can withhold. But I mean, the good portion of what I had requested was done. When the the brief hadn't been filed yet, it, the case was basically dead. It was in limbo before she yeah. filed her third 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 brief. So so basically, they can say whatever they want, and it, when it's suiting them, you know, to gain something out of this, they can say it's still the investigation is still open. Yeah. My point is to have main uh, some of the major players in uh, this case, like Kratz. Fact Bender, what's his name, Andy, go and openly talk about this and make all of this right now. I don't know, you know, maybe because making a murderer had Zellner in it as well. I, what I'm trying to say, I don't know that that was really a smart thing for them to do. The, the in, I, my personal feeling is that it's backfired very, very badly. Um, on them, and it, it's really put the spotlight back on them. Like uh, Sapakop just said, uh, things were starting to quieten down. Uh, people weren't talking about it very, very much. And now all of a sudden, all the police officers, all the investigators are now pulled back into the spotlight again, right? And uh, I, I think some of them would not have appreciated that. And just my final comment is this. The film directors, um, uh, Riccardi and Demos, put up a list of all the officers that didn't want to appear or talk or comment in uh, making a murderer, right? 
And of course, a lot of those officers chose not to appear on convicting a murderer either. To me, that says a lot, right? That it, they didn't want does, to express their opinions. It yeah, it does, Doc. Go ahead. Correct, correct. Uh, Katie, what did you think? Um, good idea or bad idea for law enforcement convicting a murderer? Well, I mean, I think it really just, like, they looked like clowns in making a murder, but in convicting a murder, they just, they really just doubled down on that. You've got, um, you know, you've got Andrew Colburn remembering things suddenly. I mean, it's just ridiculous. You got Ken Kratz who can't keep his temper under it's just i mean they really just look like a bunch of fools and you know if it affects law enforcement overall it would just be in the fact that people que would question how many how many law enforcement agents are dirty i mean we don't know i mean you see them um, as the cases fall out and and the evidence falls out um you know, sapper cop, he's inside. He, you know, he has better insight. So, yeah, I mean, they just made fools of themselves. Okay. Interesting, Katie. Uh, I don't recall. What about yourself? What, what, what effect do you think Cam had on law enforcement? Um, I think it made the, like, I guess, like Sapper said, the, the local ones look even worse in my opinion. And, and like Kay said, the, the overall, it's just, you just don't know which ones to trust, I guess. Good point. Good point. Uh, Neverly, Neverly, what about yourself? Was Cam good for law enforcement? Yes or no? For law enforcement of uh, Manitowoc and Calumet County, I yeah. don't think it was a good look because... You, I don't know, man, but I could see, clearly see what they were doing. You know, Andy being this goofball and like, la, la, you know, ah, not appealing, not believable what he was saying. He just, again, did not appear believable. Again, again. And then we know what he actually, that he lied and all of that. So, oof, I don't know about that. Fassbender, what is he going to say? You know, we set him up. What is he going to say? The investigation was shoddy and we needed something to tie Stephen for this because we were after him. What what were they going to say? Correct. Correct. I don't know what they were thinking. So, I don't know. Interesting. Thank you, Neverly. Um, Susan, what about yourself? Was it a good look yeah. or bad? I think it was a bad look. at The way they tried to explain away a lot of the shady... Uh, stuff they did in this case just made them look ridiculous. I think, you know, they tried to um, uh, cover the the point that, you know, the coroner wasn't called. Well, you know, you don't have to call a coroner. And the, um, uh, what else? Well, they said there was no, Sean said there was no explanation for the keys. So they didn't include that. <laughs> Correct. But um, and then Andy's new explanation. He suddenly remembered what he did on his day off when he couldn't remember back, you know, uh, at Correct. the time. Correct. And then the whole knee thing, and just yeah, just the just lame excuses, as far as I'm concerned, for for things that are shady in this case, and it did nothing to to make me believe that they were honest, good cops. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, Susan. Sepakop, do you have a comment, sir? Well, one thing I was going to say once you'd gotten through the group was there's there's one there's one big question mark that, that they may have created by doing what they've done. So even after MAM came out uh, and, and all, a lot of the blowback that, that came against the, the folks in Manitowoc, whether it was law enforcement, whether it was the state, um, et cetera, there, there was still nobody really in danger because remember, there, there was no honor among thieves. 
And so what I've been waiting for all of this time is for one of these folks to get stabbed in the back, get get flipped or whatever, and and then turn and go to KZ. That's what I've been waiting for. And in my opinion, that's that's the only thing left that's going to break this case. Now it hasn't happened yet, but now you had now you had Colburn's lawsuit come out, and Colburn basically got fed to the wolves because at the end of the day, he yes. basically had a federal court calling him a liar. Um, that that's big, and there was nobody there to to back him up. Um, he he was he was left hanging in the wind. He so. Was. There, you, there is, there is the potential that now, after Ma'am, after Cam, and after that Colburn lawsuit shamble, somebody could realize, "Ooh, I didn't take that too well. I don't feel good about this. Let me go talk to KZ." Yeah, you, I agree with you, Sepakop. And uh, the mere fact that the mere fact of that they didn't even give Colburn the time that he did the call in the plates. Remember the that that it took like a couple of years before that information got released. It goes to show that they left him hanging and dangling, whereas had that information been provided, it would have solved a lot of issues for, for Colburn back during the trial, right? And uh, the, the, But to give that information up meant that law enforcement were recording the calls, right? And, that, and that's what Remica let out until Remica then had to hand over the uh, the police calls because things were being recorded. Uh, Jack 61. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, this. Uh, my comment was really uh, directed uh, towards uh, what uh, Safra was talking about, uh, Colburn being left basically the twist in the wind. And that's why, that is exactly what happened. And even worse, and I've said it before, I think he, I think he got really screwed by signing that, that exclusivity deal with uh, convicting order and he couldn't talk to anyone else and, and get his story out. Like, whether we agree with his story or not, that's not the point. It's the point of muzzling him. So he couldn't talk to anyone else. I, I think it was a, I think it was highly manipulative and I, I don't agree with it at all. Interesting. Um, just wondered, did you have a comment? Uh, no, no, I, well, I put in the chat that I think I misunderstood your question at the beginning. That's uh, right. I was, think, I was thinking way too deeply. Yeah, they, I, I'm with Kay. They look like a bunch of clowns, um, and they looked like they just, uh, I think I also commented in the chat, uh, they were doubling down on their inner clown when they did CAM, those that did participate. Um, they had so, to. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, because they're like you guys said, they're protecting the conviction, of course. Correct. Um, but I did want to uh, Destia, Destia, Welcome. I'm not sure how to pronounce, Welcome. says new to the group, honest question was it the police or Stephen Avery's family members that set Stephen Avery up? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> that is a good question. Oh, or both. Or both. Or both. Maybe or both. <laughs> yeah, I choose, yeah, we could. I choose letter C. <laughs> We could uh, we could do an entire live just on that question alone, and yep. spend three or four hours. <laughs> yeah, easily. I I think um, I think it could be both. I, I really really do. Uh, but that's a brilliant question. And welcome. I agree with the Sapper Cop. Um, it could easily be both. Can we have the Jexis one? Unless there's any comments. I got Can one last have... comment. Then I I'll, I'll put that back up while I'm doing that. Um, there we go. Uh, my comment is, and I don't remember which episode it was, but I'm thinking it was like episode seven or eight. Fastbender was talking. He said, yeah, there were some mistakes made. You're damn right. There were a huge amount of mistakes made. And uh, yes. that's, part of, that's part of the problem. That, that was really my comment. Correct. Correct. Well, the, the way I saw convicting a murderer, it was sort of like the um, Brenda was acting on the behalf of law enforcement. She was essentially their mouthpiece, uh, essentially giving law enforcement side of the story of what yes. happened, right? Uh, but I, I do believe the mere fact that there were so many um, high-ranking uh, investigators and officers that weren't involved 
uh, in convicting a murderer, I think says a lot. I mean, would you have liked to have had comments from Mike Bushman and uh, Sergeant Jason Joist? I would have loved it. Had Absolutely. They appeared, or simple. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Had they appeared, it would have been just absolutely awesome to to get their stories, what they saw, what they found, et cetera, et cetera. But we never really got any of that, which is a real pity. What um, about what about what about that they were asked and, and declined? Yeah. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> absolutely, hundred percent. Can we have a look at slide two, at Jack sixty one? <laughs> All right. So, in convicting a murderer. The way they introduced the show was they introduced us to specific characters. And these characters were very important because you see them right throughout um, the whole entire series. Uh, we had now, I do not know who these people are. I've never talked to them before. Some of you guys may know who they are. I do not. But we were introduced to Alex, uh, John, uh, by the name of uh, Puzzled by It All. We had Dave. And we also had Rich. Now, what is remarkable, guys, is that all four were called case enthusiasts. Guys, do we have any comments about the case enthusiasts? Oh, they, were clearly making, yeah, they were clearly making a distinction between them and Avery supporters or whatever they you know, called us. Yeah. We, we weren't, Everybody we're not case knows enthusiasts. they're guilters. Come on. <laughs> right, state advocates, no doubt. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, those 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 particular people fit the agenda and the narrative that Cam was looking to tell. They were chosen for a reason. They are, they are probably, well, I, I don't know much about Dave because I don't know who he is on the Reddit side or, or any of that. But the other three, we all know very, very well. Um, throughout the years of, of going through this case. Um, so we know that their stance. Um, so there's that. <laughs> yes, correct. But, um, but don't you like the approach that um, Cam had in that both Alex uh, or the case enthusiasts, they all started by saying they believed in the innocence of both Stephen and Brendan by watching Ma'am. Did you like that approach? Yeah, <laughs> which, which of course isn't isn't true at all. Um, I'm pretty sure that the three I mentioned, Alex, aka Super Pickle, Puzzled by It All, and Rich Donovan, have never ever been. Well, R Rich will try to claim he was pro Avery, but I actually don't think he ever was. I think he was a plant. But uh, uh, th those three are are what what. You know, most people on the truth or side would consider militant guilters uh, just because of the way they approach all of us um, in in whatever form or fashion. You know, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Reddit, um, they are especially puzzled by it all. If you if, if you want a good idea who those people are, go to Reddit, punch in their names, Super Pickle or Puzzled by It All, whichever, and go read some of their posts. Go read some of their comments. That'll tell you all you need to know. Very, very interesting. Uh, does anyone have any comments, additional comments? I can't see your microphone, so just speak up, guys. I've read some of their comments, and they are foul, foul, nasty people from what I have seen. And I'll tell you that uh, Alex, a.k.a. Super Pickle, she's a mod on the – in the uh, – making a murder sub she hasn't made a comment as far as i know and i can go look but it's probably been three at least three years under her super pickle name her mod name I, I'm, I imagine she's got an alt that she uses to protect her super pickle uh, identity on reddit so yeah but, uh, she was the one who said that she couldn't understand that all these people aka us you know the truthers would get together in all these groups and discuss the case. And I'm thinking, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? You're a yeah. freaking leader over there, a mod, and you are wondering about us? And a sub that she, in a sub of a docu series that she professes to hate. What? What are you doing? You, you don't like this material. Why would you want to moderate in a sub 
of people that do like the material and want to research it further. What are you doing, really? Correct. So controlling, anyone, con controlling the flow of information. Sorry, Doc. Yeah, I was going to say, has anyone here personally had any, any interaction with these four? And also in chat, have you had any interaction uh, with these four uh, people? And how have you found that experience? Positive or negative? Because I'll tell you what, I've checked a few of the uh, Reddit uh, groups. Oh, my God, the amount of vitriol and utter hatred is off the charts. Is that what you find, guys? It's yeah. I've, I've, I've interacted with uh, all but, well, I, I don't know Dave, but uh, I've interacted with the other three. Go on, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Rhonda, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, I have I have had interaction with Puzzle uh, what, when I used to be on Reddit, actually, when I was fairly new to Reddit about the case. Yes. Uh, and I didn't understand rules necessarily or, or really maybe even pay attention to them. But I was making comments back and forth with Puzzle uh, in yes. his Reddit. And I said something about... Um, I said something about being crazy about about his ideas being crazy or something like that, and the fucker had me uh, banned, <laughs> not banned, but what did he call it, Jack? Um, uh, well, he had me thrown out. Suspend, or whatever. Sus I, suspended. Suspended. He had yeah. me suspended because I used the word crazy in reference to a comment that he was making see, to me, and I thought, see, oh, okay. See, now I know and, and, where I am. <laughs> this, this is another problem that we ran into in Reddit. I didn't really get into it. I'm not going to do it now. Other than to say you had a group of guilter mods within this subreddit that would selectively just, they would delete uh, Truther's posts. They would de delete their comments. We, there was one that got, that, that they would used to pick a fight with people and start calling them names. And I'm not talking about this like you dummy. I'm talking about like bad, bad names. Yes. And, and then she would go back. It, a report would get made, but she would go back and delete all the, the entire conversation. And she said, well, I didn't say anything. What are you talking about? Well, of course, that didn't last too long because people were screenshotting and, and, and yeah. caught her doing it. I, I guess she got in some trouble, but they didn't throw her out. That was, she should, should have been removed as a mod. You don't do that shit. Yeah, correct. Correct. Um, Sepacop, do you have a comment? Um, uh, about these ones, no, I, I pretty much kind of, well, I mean, um, uh, unless you really want to dig into like Rich Donovan, for example, because the things he's done have been um, so much boy. worse than anybody else on that screen. Um, on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms, in terms of digitally stalking and harassing people, threatening them of like actual threats of violence. Um, that, that he's committed on multiple different members, not just one person, and all of them are female. Um, you know, if, if somebody wants to dig into that, have at it. But that that is one nasty individual right there. Um, but again, Sean, Sean Reck and them give him all kinds of airtime, like he's, like he's this knowledgeable person, but never say anything about those kind of things he did. Yeah. Well, it, yeah. He, bosom, bosom, but he became bosom buddies with uh, Ken Kratz, you know, back in 2018, 2019, that's how he got his entryway into convicting a murder. I'm sure of it. I'm 100% convinced. Yeah. And we all know that Brenda Schuler is well aware of all of these people and their, the way that they have interacted on oh, yeah. Reddit and Twitter. Twitter. And wherever, Facebook. Facebook. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, correct. It, it, it looks like um, what they've done especially Brenda, maybe others, they've screenshotted everyone's comments, right? Good, bad, or otherwise. And you're you're right, Susan. There's no doubt that Brenda would have been aware of their posting history, the way they responded to people. Um, it sort of gave me the impression that convicting a murder was always putting up the negative comments coming from truthers and uh, not really so much from guilters, uh, the so-called state advocates, uh, seem very lopsided in that regard. Sepakop, do you have a comment? Uh, no, no. Okay. So um, just so that we can move on. So you'll see right throughout uh, convicting a murderer, especially these four individuals, 
and how they transform right throughout the series, right? And it's interesting that they are called case enthusiasts. So Jack 61, if we can have a look at the next slide, please. This is very interesting. Now, we were also introduced, especially in episode one and episode two, we were introduced to uh, Paula, Megan, uh, Christine, and they are regarded, now wait for it, they're regarded as Avery Dassey supporters, not case enthusiasts, but as supporters. And here we have uh, Rookie, uh, Andy uh, Rookie. He's known as a justice advocate. So what is the difference, you reckon, between the case enthusiasts and the Avery Dassey supporters as portrayed by Cam? Do you think they were shown differently or equally? What was your impression, guys? Uh, Jack61. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean, to me, to, to tag people in this matter, it was clearly thought out and done with purpose, right? Yes. Yeah, it's like it's like Kristen and Megan walking in you know, the first time that they had a conversation with Brenda with empty hands. She's sitting there with her computer and, you know, volumes of all kinds of paperwork and Yes. You know, the, the, the lop, I mean, to me, I just see the lopsidedness of that scale right off the bat. So uh, I, I think that, I think they, overall, they showed Rookie in a, in a really good light. Um, I think they were kind of fair. I know he did, I know that he filmed many, many hours with them. I don't know exactly how many. I know, I just know it was a lot. Um, I don't think they showed nearly enough of his interaction with what he had to say because rookie, um, I can, I can tell you, I got a lot of my drive and, and intuition from him and the way he approached what he was doing. Uh, it really impressed me uh, because it was a bit different way of thinking, uh, and trying to get information, you know, that I, I, that's, that's kind of how I look at what we do. Separate copies, right? We're not lawyers. We're not, not court officials. But if we can gather information to pass on to KZ or, you know, Laura and, and, and uh, Drizzen to help them, that I think that's our role. That's what I think of it. And nothing more than that. And Rookie was really, really good at that. Really good. So I think for him, they did a really good job. This whole thing with Kristen, God almighty. I, I mean, just <laughs> well, I mean, just from what I've read, and, and, you know, I knew before because she had a lot of interaction with the German Siegfried and all that shit. And I mean, a lot. There's a, I've got a ton of text messages that she was involved in. And then this transformation from yes. truther to guilter, and she didn't know about all this other information. And it was out there provably out there already and she didn't bother to read it and didn't understand it uh that's it and then ultimately you know her son and i have all the sympathy in the world for her child passing away but to lay this blame at his feet no sorry i got a real problem there i i would more call her transformation from truther to screen star <laughs> to screen star yeah i agree Interesting. 100 Susan. Yep. Uh, Sepikop, do you have a comment, sir? Well, yeah. I mean, the 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 labeling was 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 very purposeful. They wanted to they wanted to differentiate between the people that the the documentary I'm going to use that very loosely was going to agree with, and those that they were going to later try to discredit or trash, which is you know that was their intent so they that was very purposeful um and then in in terms of Kristen and megan they were going to use them later as a coup d'etat now see here we've taken these supporters and by by the information we've shown them now they're against you know avery and dassey see what happens when you learn the truth kind of thing um so i mean that's 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 very upfront you, you you'd have to be an idiot not to not to see that um, but I, I, I real I didn't notice the, the different labeling for rookie as a justice advocate versus an Avery Dassey supporter that that's, yeah. that's different. But, um, I I'm, I'm with Jack there when it, when it comes to, 
you know, if you want to, if you want to think of in terms of this community as, as having any, you know, uh, experts or, or heads of the class or anything like that, R- rookie would definitely fall into that category. Um, just based on, on steps he took and things he was able to do information he was able to provide and such, um, definitely agree there. And, and they definitely certainly treated him differently than they did anybody else that was labeled a supporter and everybody did. else, everybody else, they tried to make look stupid, but but rookie, they 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 uh, used kid gloves with for sure, in 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 in, the, in that respect. Correct, and also remember, he took on Ken Kratz face to face, and that would that would not would not have been easy to do. Right? And won, and won. As far as I'm concerned, he yeah, won. Idiot. Yeah, um, that's um, that's a pretty distressing thing to do because you could tell that Kratz was absolutely fired up. It would not have been easy uh, trying to take Ken Kratz on, but uh, I'm glad that he did. I'm glad that they put that in the show. Do we have any other comments, guys? Uh, Sabacop, you have another comment? Uh, no, I, I was actually just going to say I'm 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 going to have to jump off. Um, got some <laughs> life going on, so. I know, that's um, awesome. But uh, I was glad to we got to be able to join you guys for a bit. Uh, if if I have a chance, maybe I'll jump back in if you guys are still going. Oh, well, I'm sure we still will be going, but we'll probably do part two tomorrow. We'll probably okay. do part two tomorrow. Yeah, awesome. Hey, thanks, thanks for thanks for coming. Safer. Yeah, thanks for coming, Safra. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Jack sixty one. Can we have a look at the next slide, please? So okay, so quite clearly here, you had to have those individuals that were were there on the ground, so to speak. And that's why we have uh, Anjanette Levy. Uh, as you know, she was a very young reporter back uh, back in 2005 when, when she was reporting the case. And you see her throughout the series as well. I think she did a really, really good job. And my impression of her was that she was actually quite neutral. She was actually very, very neutral. Um, her comments were really, really well done. Um, she really said it as as she saw it, and she had a lot of interaction with both Stephen and Brendan Dassey, and I'm sure Jack61 will tell you all about the <laughs> interview <laughs> that she did with uh, Brendan, right, Jack61? Yeah, you know, other than that interview, interview I, I overall agree with you, but that interview she did with Brendan uh, is really troubling for me, and I know it is for a lot of people because of how she treated him, the questions she was posing. It was like she was trying to trick him and trap him into making some kind of admission right there on the phone. Right. And uh, I, I just, I didn't agree with it at all. I didn't like it. Um, but, you know, I think overall she, she did a, a pretty, uh, pretty good job. I think so. I think so. I, she, her comments remained fairly neutral throughout the series and uh, was very interesting because, remember, she was there. Uh, she had a bird's eye view of what was going on, and she did ask. I remember she did ask um, Garn some really interesting questions about Ida Merfell, which was fantastic. So we had Anjanette Levy, we had Jim Haggerty. Um, uh, he's a pretty controversial type of guy. Has anyone had any dealings with uh, Jim? I, I, I have. Just seen him. But... You go ahead, Mister. Yeah, I, I just would like to comment on Anjanette for a minute. Um, yes, please. And her interview with Brendan. You know, you have to remember that she's just coming off Kratz's news conference at that time. Um, so it's kind of understandable the way she treated Brendan. Um, you know, most people in that area, even the ones that were doubting their guilt or Stephen's guilt, you know, flipped to guilty after that news conference. I think she was being a reporter going by what Kratz said and trying to get the truth out of Brendan. Um, She hadn't watched the interviews yet. You know, she heard some really, really horrible stuff at that. And I think she was just trying to to, um, suss it out, you know. Correct. Well, for me, Anjanette, I really had high hopes for her. I know that she was young and hungry, you know, like to make it in her career. And it was really tough to comment on this case. And we know why. 
you know, because it was so controversial. So you have to think about your personal life, your career and everything and your job at the end of the day. And I thought that she may be the one to uh, to keep asking all these questions and to probe more and more. But then I got really disappointed when I was watching Cam or what she was saying. I don't know, maybe that's just my personal um, uh, impression of her, but I expected that she would actually probe and dig deeper into the case. But then I guess, you know, she's got a mortgage to pay and I'm sure to pay for her kids' schools yes. and stuff. You know, she did make one comment in Cam that made me believe that she still isn't sure whether they're guilty or not. I, I can't quote it verbatim, but okay. Uh, well, good. Yeah. 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 Uh, no, I, I thought I thought she was actually quite fair. Um, a good voice of reason, actually. Um, Jim Haggerty, I think he's got his own podcast series. Um, is that correct? I think I, I left a comment on one of his podcasts. Um, he he got a lot of basic facts wrong about the case, um, but and then the other guy is Dan O'Donnell, who looks like he's been drinking too many cappuccinos, right? What were, what were your impressions? Of oh, you're being nice. You're yeah. being nice. Maybe in a powder form or Crazy. something. Yeah. What were, your impressions <laughs> of, uh, what were your impressions of Dan? Guys, uh, Susan. Uh, filled with hate, anger, um, uh, and crazy... Um, the way he moved and talked and you know very uh, agitated very agitated very very agitated yeah 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 and they gave him a lot of airtime too they did it's a mind boggler yeah they did they did does anyone have any other comments uh, jack 61 what were your impressions of uh, day uh yeah like susan said he, he was really fidgety and highly animated making faces and doing body movements and to me, this is someone and that's trying eyes. to in the eyes. Yeah, he's trying to convince you to his body language of something he says he believes. He, he made, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've been around him. I really haven't had too much interaction with him or, or uh, this other fellow, Jim Haggerty. I've just seen him around uh, th throughout the years, and uh, I, I just don't agree with their approach because they're they're willing to ignore certain key things they just ignore it and that's okay right but um the thing that struck me <laughs> he's a amygdala was hijacked yes the thing that struck me is um he continuously made all these straw man arguments right can you believe this yep. this and this and i'm thinking myself wait a minute who the hell said that and he's the one that's saying the saying the sentence and answering his own question then basically pointing a finger at uh, supporters uh, saying, you know, how could you possibly believe in this? And to me, that that form of exaggeration, um, I think he lost a lot of credibility in that regard, whereas I think someone like Anjanette was fairly level-headed right throughout the podcast series, uh, the, the, the series, Convicting a Murder series, and she even said, oh, Am I being recorded? Am I going to be in the series? So I think she was actually quite surprised <laughs> that her comments actually made it. Because remember, guys, a lot of this material was uh, recorded many, many years ago. Right? We were interviewed over three years ago. And you could tell that both um, Tom Fassbender, there's a sort of like a younger version of him, and you could see that he's aged. So that would have filmed him over a long period of time. Would you guys agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'd right. like to read Danny Mellis's comment. Yes, uh, please. He, yes, please. Dan O'Donnell has a huge Wisconsin political voice and reach. If you want to win the political fight, you need him. That's very interesting. I didn't I wasn't aware of that. Interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah, so as you can see, um, Convicting a Murder had all different types of characters. And then let's have a look at the next slide. This well, is That where... explains his presence in Cam. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And this now, uh, um, now we were dropped into Convicting a Murderer. 
And uh, as I said to you before, we're, we're regarded as part of the truth community. Susan, do you see the slide? I do, Doc. Would you like to read out what a truther is, please? Someone who does not believe the generally accepted explanation for an event or situation and thinks it is the result of a secret plan made oh. by powerful people. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, and would you, well, would you like to know what, what's underneath that? Before you comment, Neverly. <laughs> yep, he... He, 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 he is he, a truther, one of those who believes that 9-11 was some sort of government operation. And the synonym? Theorist. There yes, you go. The synonym. So, um, oh and guess God. what? <laughs> Did you realize that you're a conspiracy theorist? Um, now, so basically that's the way uh, our group was introduced on convicting a murderer. And uh, uh, let me tell you, we were interviewed for many, many hours and i reckon at least well 50 to 60 percent of that time was spent arguing with both brenda and also her sidekick ricky um jack 61 what do you remember of our interviews oh yeah i mean yeah there's a lot of a lot of that uh which you know took time away from actually answering you know actual case questions then there was right. you know we had some te technical difficulties and then back to more arguing and get back on track it, it was it's pretty rough but you know i think we i don't know how many I, I didn't really time it but out of the i'm gonna guess 25 hours that we were interviewed over the four interviews you know what did we end up with maybe two three minutes tops something like that yeah. correct yeah so we we were inter we were interviewed for i think four or five sessions four. Uh, we had Perfect. um four yeah four and we, we thought we were going to be talking about the murder case. Yeah. But we, we spent 95% talking about uh, Stephen Avery's history uh, and how bad, of, how bad of a person he was. Rather than actually talking about the forensic evidence, we actually discussed very little of the case. And what does Sean Rick say on smokescreen? Uh, we gave Stephen that one. They did the wrong thing to him in 1985 and we're there. You're kidding. You're not gonna you're not gonna put any of that in your documentary. Oh, oh of course yeah, not. Instant, we're not gonna include that. And we're thinking, oh my god. <laughs> what hey, else? Hey Doc. Can... Yeah, yes, yes. Susan. Hey, what is the source on this uh truth or definition? Um I'm I'm not sure. Um I could look it up, uh what a truth is, but somebody this is asked and I'm curious as well. Yeah, this is what they came up with, and we can we can put in the word truth. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get different different versions of it. But yeah, uh, Miss, if I could just say something, Mr. Really? President said uh, accusing others of being conspiracy theorists is a guilty narcissist's favorite form of gaslighting, and I happen to yeah. agree to that because. Correct. I commented already, I said the subliminal message is that asking question, questions is wrong. So there's a negative connotation about being a truther, you know, which... Well, well, well Neverly, if I could just say it before course. you say it, you, you've hit the nail on the head. The state advocates, wait for it, have taken the higher ground. We obviously are not on the same parallel in terms of we are regarded as conspiracy theorists because we potentially believe that maybe one or two law enforcement officers may have planted or altered forensic evidence. So hence we believe in, a, as they pointed out in convicting a murder, a grand vast conspiracy which none of us have ever said has actually <laughs> taken place and that uh that uh, lady uh, i think or destia i'm sorry if you're male or female I, I do not know said probably one of the best questions i've read in a long time was a law enforcement was it a family member that set stephen up and i'll tell you what uh, i reckon it's it's potentially looking as both that's the scary, scary part, right, guys? Sorry, uh, Neverly, for cutting in. Keep going. Oh, no. Uh, that's all I wanted to talk about is that 
they bundled us up in this negative connotation, troublemakers and, right you know, yes, Straight right off, off the bat. bat. Exactly. Yep, correct. And um, I, I don't think Brenda Schuller was really actually prepared for us. What do you think, guys? No, probably not. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I think to some degree, I think she knew, you know, that I'd been around, you'd been around, and, and, and you know, some of the others had been around and, and knew quite a bit about the cases. But, um, yeah, I don't think she knew that we knew as much as we did. Correct. And, of course, we had just done the 1985 case, right? We yep. spent a lot of time looking at the 1985 case, the depositions. So we already had a huge amount of information. And I'm not quite sure she knew how to how to take us, especially me. Well, <laughs> and, and Rick. You, you about DNA. <laughs> Rick was clearly uh, couldn't hold himself back. No. You know, in, in the background and, you know, literally – this ended up taking over the conversation, which I, I really personally don't think Brenda appreciated him doing that. And I don't blame her. You know, she, it was her task to ask questions and to, you know, have this, this dialogue. And he absolutely just wrecked it. He just wrecked it. It was terrible. Yeah. And uh, for those who didn't know, um, it was uh, Brenda who appeared on camera and we appeared on camera ourselves, low quality. And um, she had a sidekick right next to her who kept on interrupting her every, what, 30 seconds at least? Well, in the beginning, you know, he, he was pretty quiet, the first interview. Second yep. interview, he started asking questions and, and interrupting. And as the time went on, it, it was every question. It was an interruption. It was crazy. Correct, correct. So we actually never had a proper interview we kept, uh, Brenda kept on being interrupted by, by Ricky, her sidekick, and the questions that he was asking were designed uh, designed to get us really angry. Oh, that yeah. That was the whole idea, to really get us angry. And I remember arguing with Brenda how um, she kept on stretching things much more than what they were meant. Like there was no evidence that, particular events took place, but she wanted us to admit to it. Yep. We, knew, we knew where she was going in that particular line of questioning, and we put a halt straight to it saying, hey, no. you're speculating now, right, Jack 61? That's, right. That's right. I'm just agreeing with you, Doc. That's exactly right. Yep, correct. So, uh, and we, uh, uh, there was yeah. another, I remember this clearly, we were talking during the interview for Cam. Uh, they, we were talking about the red trailer, but not Stevens, the oh, one correct. in the in the hunting grounds. Deer camp. Deer camp. Yeah, correct. deer camp. And Brenda pulled up a picture and she said, it's clearly not red. It wasn't red. Okay, it was burgundy. So it got that nitpicking. Correct. Yeah. So it uh, wasn't just, red, it was burgundy. Uh, burgundy car. It, just to answer Mr. President, no, we weren't in the same room. Uh, we we were in different parts of the world, and uh, we got but to get. To, to be fair about that, Neverly, it was burgundy <laughs> on the back side of it, and the front side of it was like camo. It was burgundy with camo, some camo. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. when burgundy okay, but you had to pick a color. You would say it's red. You wouldn't go, oh, it's a hue of fuchsia with a you know touch of magenta. You know. Yeah. yeah. Correct. It was right. on yeah. yeah, no, we weren't together in the same room. Uh, we were in different parts of the world. And uh, like I said, uh, we we recorded the interviews ourselves. And uh, let us know in chat one day if you want to hear some of the, our interview. <laughs> but uh, we'll have to edit it because, um, yeah, there's a lot of filler stuff. But let us know if you're interested in hearing about some of our uh, behind-the-scenes discussions with Brenda and Ricky. All right, uh, Jack 61, can we have the uh, next slide, please? Now, to me, this was truly remarkable. And as soon as I saw both Earl and Candy uh, uh, in convicting a murder, I thought, oh my God, you've got to be kidding, right? 
and you see Earl Avery, who of course is Stephen's own brother, talk right throughout the uh, series. And let me tell you right now, uh, Earl is extremely scathing of his own brother. He definitely believes in Stephen Avery's guilt. Uh, I think he also believes his nephew, Brendan, is guilty as well. Uh, and uh, Candy as well, um, uh, ex-sister-in-law of Stephen, who first of all defended Stephen and now firmly believes in their guilt. Guys, uh, does anyone have any comments? Speak up because I can't see your microphone. Okay, well, we we knew, uh, Brenda did tell us that she talked to some of the family. I cannot recall exactly if she named who exactly she talked to. I think that she had an in with Carla. I could be wrong about that. But um, I don't know what possessed uh, Earl. I don't care about Candy, frankly, but about Earl yes. to say what he had to say. I, I, I just don't see it. What's the take? Okay. I think um, Candy possessed him. <laughs> Could be. I don't know. It was very, very surprising how strongly he came against Stephen. But he did say in ma'am that if he saw Stephen or thought that Stephen did it, that he would have reported it to him. Oh, look. Someone, Gloria, made the comment. Um... I'll read it out. When I met Earl, he believed that they were innocent. I think Stephen and him had a falling out, and now they're saying that they're guilty. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely do believe that. There's a lot of tension uh, between all the family members. And if you listen to some of the phone calls, Stephen Avery is now blaming uh, everybody, uh, all his family members, and there's clearly a, a horrible split. And, and mind you, that was deliberate, right, Jack61? From the get-go, uh, the investigators, um, Skorlinski was trying to convince the, um, uh, both brothers and the sister of Stephen Avery's guilt, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted that division, they and also they went after Jody as well. So, yeah, you're right. There's no doubt that um, Chuck, sorry, that Earl is no fan of... Um, of, of his brother Stephen. Yeah, there's that there's that trailer. Yeah, it, it was wobbling a little bit. Does anyone have uh, any um uh, any comments? You have to speak up because I can't see your mics. So oh, I was you trying to show what? that I was trying to what? I was trying to show this red trailer. Uh, I, I I'll get it here. I used another yep. rap. Let me try this. Yep. Were, were you surprised about Earl and Candy being uh, on cam? Who was surprised? I was. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I was not surprised about Candy, I guess, but I was I was disgusted uh, by seeing Earl and listening to the things that he was saying. Uh, against his own brother. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Correct. Exactly. Correct. Correct. Susan, do you have any? See, yeah, I was surprised to see Earl, for yeah. sure. I bet. I wonder if he would have done that if uh, Mama Avery was still here. Yeah. Um, I'd be surprised, but I could be wrong. Good question. Yep. Yep. He's he's Jack sixty one. You want to talk about this trailer? I just wanted to show it. You know, just. I mean, to me, yeah, it's burgundy, but you know, I probably would call it maroon or or reddish maroon. Wine. Um, yeah, I, I mean, mean it's, we not, can go it's, on and on. If that was the question, what color was it? But if you compare it to the other trailer, which is like now, I can see that it's aquamarine or aqua, whatever mint. Right. I would say white and red. But what Brenda showed us was the front side of that trailer, which was camo painted. Um, I think that it had you this you color with. Yes, I do. It was this color, whatever we want to call it, On the back. but uh, yeah. with some camo in it. But it was definitely, uh, see, there you go. That's the one, that's the camo. So it's like widespread pattern. It wasn't. Pretty low quality yeah. photo, but you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can see the camo part. Is that true, Paris? Yeah. 
yeah. to Paris for us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the, the reason why we were going, why, why, are you, why are you talking about this? And she did the same thing about the ambulance at Cass Road, right? Um, and the reason why is because in a lot of reports, they talk about the red trailer, right? And um, the impression that uh, I got was that she was saying, oh, no, when they ever talk about the red trailer, they're talking about Stephen's red trailer. And we said, no, there's an actual red trailer at the deer camp. And in some of the dog reports, I think, of uh, Sarah Faust, they mentioned the red trailer. So it's interesting that Loof went right around the deer camp and hit, did an alert on the burn barrel uh, outside that garage, right? So that's very, very interesting. So to me, I must admit, I was shocked when I saw Earl. And I was shocked when I heard some of the comments that he was saying, like, all these, remember what he said? 100 cars, 100 cops, they're all liars. They're all this. And I'm thinking, Earl, what are you talking about? His own brother got set up in 1985 by law enforcement, right? And remember, Earl even appeared in the pre-trial, Jack 61. Maybe he found it, Jesus or something. He might have know. found something. He might well, have found something. I think it's just really hypocritical. I mean, Earl's had his own problems. I'm not going to dive off into his personal business, but he's had uh, scrapes with the law going back, you know, at this point, 30 years, I guess. I, I don't know, back to the late 80s early 90s uh and moving forward and, and some really uh, some pretty unsavory things in on his record going right up to august of uh, i think i sent you and maybe duke or maybe everybody i can't remember but you know up to august of 2018 probably when cam started they started doing interviews with people and this was a child neglect or some kind of uh, thing that cops got called and you know i'm not going to get into too much of that but i'm just to me um with everything that earl said and i'm talking about one two three and you know even in the four he said a lot of things with nothing to back it up and he's like you know Stephen drug bear down the road by by a chain in his car you know bear was all hurt and everything but you didn't do anything if he was really if that really happened why didn't you call the police, call the vet, whatever, report it? I Nothing. I don't think that was Bear. That was back in the day. I think that. No, was I think it, I think it was Bear he was talking about. It was bear. They were talking about Bear, right? Yeah. And you, yeah. I oh, think yeah. so. And you you understand why, right? Because sure. they wanted they wanted to extend the animal cruelty, and we'll yeah. talk about that when we look at the clips, and, right? And okay. and making Bear and making Bear mean. Uh, make him very mean, 100% you correct. Know, you know what was interesting to me when I saw Earl Definitely. appear in cam? That Chuck wasn't there. No. Oh, no. man. That was really interesting. I, I'm sure he didn't want a damn thing to do with it. Nothing. Well, we can go on and be the truthers about this, if yeah, you know what can. I mean. We can. But but my point my point is this before we play the very first clip. If the lens was used by Brenda and by Candace on Earl, would Earl come out smelling like roses? Hell no. He would and be in nobody, massive, he'll be in massive no, trouble with me. No one forget, please, November 9th, when the cops come to Earl's house, Earl and Candy's house, to take him to get his fingerprints and buckle swab and all that, Candy says, well, Earl's not here. She lied to the cops right up, right away. They go in and find him. He's he's hid under a pile of clothes. Why? If he Correct. hadn't done anything, what the hell was he doing? Yeah. And no one's that ever answered that question. I've never heard any satisfactory answer. Number two, and I'll I'll shut up. Number two, the cops interviewed uh, Earl on November 9th after they uh, got the their uh, biological evidence. There's three tapes. I bitched about this, and I will continue to bitch about it. We have tape one, both sides. We have tape two, half of side A. The rest is blank. Side B is blank. Tape three is completely blank. And they will not give me a clean copy of Earl and his interview. Why the hell not? Correct. 
hundred percent correct. But uh, just to echo what Neverly said, it's very interesting that Chuck, I never wanted to appear, right? <laughs> yeah. And uh, no, we we won't go into that at this stage, right? So Too bad because I got stuff to say, but uh, it's okay. You've got stuff to say. Would you like to say now or after, Neverly? No, we can do it after. Let's stick to the point. Yeah. Okay. And On topic. Point, yeah. And the final thing here is that the voice that you'll see right throughout uh, the episodes is Tom Fassbender, right? Now, we know that Tom, he was the co-lead investigator, but also Tom and Mark Wiegert were the ones that interrogated uh, Brendan Dassey, right? So um, he's copped a lot of heat. He's copped a lot of flack. In my opinion, I don't think it's made things any easier or better for him. Guys, what's your opinion before we see the very first clip? Do you think Cam has helped Tom Fassbender? No. I, I don't That's, think it has. No. I don't think it has. Uh -uh. Susan, no way. <laughs> uh, just wonder, why, why do you say that? Well, no, I don't think it makes him look any better. I think he looks like he's trying to... Well, everything, every time I remember him speaking, he was saying, we believe, or it appears that, or it looked like, or, you know, he, and it just looked like he was trying to, uh, I think Jack kind of refers to it too, uh, quite often, but um, he kind of tries to, um, he's too, he's going at defending everything he did too hard, like, I can't explain what I mean, but he's trying that, that, too hard to defend trying himself. To justify. That, he's trying to that, justify. That, that, there you go. The, yes, thou, yes. Thou, thou dost protest too much. Thou doth, do, yep, thou doth protest too much, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Excellent. being an experienced um, uh, police <clears throat> officer, as he is, law enforcement, Oh yeah. and I'm sure he'd done many interviews, and the fact that he tries to say that there was no coercion involved, you know. Um, he knew, he knew exactly what was happening. If not, he, he he's dumb. Well, you know, I mean, some, some of some of his comments are actually quite frightening. Um, that he that he makes as if he, he go. Uh, we'll, we'll have a look at the clips, but I'm just saying, just keep an eye on Tom Fassbender. It's very very interesting, and my understanding is that uh, Brenda had a very good relationship with Tom Fassbender and also with um, Andrew, uh, Andrew Colburn. Is that correct, guys? That's the impression we got when we were talking with uh, Brenda. When we were oh, absolutely. oh, absolutely. Correct. All right. Well, look, guys, let's actually um, start the clips. Like, I reckon we, if we do half of them today and discuss them, and Jack61, are you quite happy to uh, continue – um, in tomorrow's podcast. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because, um, yeah, look, I apologize. We've spent two hours, but I, I think it was important to get um, an overall arching, overarching uh, idea of what CAM was all about. I think just playing the clips in isolation really wouldn't have met very much. But now understanding the background where we came in as a group, I think the clips will make a lot more sense now. Yeah. J61, okay. would you like to play the very first clip? I will. Here it comes. Clip one. Yeah. And then, you know, the whole thing blew up. CBS 5's Alga Haliberta tells us this missing person's case involves a strange twist. I don't know if I'm a suspect. You know, I don't know. The more senior no, 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 reporter, no, 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 no. she and another photographer said, you're never going to believe where this woman went. And they said, Thank Stephen you. Avery's. And I said, what? She's a freelance photographer and was working for the Auto Trader magazine Monday, taking pictures of used cars up for sale. You saw her leave? Yeah. You, tell me about that. Well, she took a picture and she writes down the serial number. Uh, she collects the money. Then... She goes to her car and turns around and leaves. She wasn't there no more than well, five minutes. The Two Rivers man was wrongly convicted of sexual assault in 1985, but exonerated with DNA evidence in 2003. Now, two years later, he again finds himself tied to a police investigation. 
I said, this guy's got some bad luck. I'm like, this is crazy. I remember it being a shock, a statewide shock that this guy who just months earlier was this hero, was the prime suspect in the disappearance and likely murder of a young woman. Wow, wow. Now, Jack61, before we comment, are you able to play back the part where you see the burn barrel in the background? Can you fast, are you able to fast forward it to that bit? It's a still where he's talking to the reporter and you can see the actual burn barrel in the background. Are you able to do it? And then. Can you kind of give me an idea of where, let me see here. If I can yeah, it's it. about halfway in. Yep, it's coming up. You'll see it. Yeah, there. There, there. Can you freeze that? Now, yep. <clears throat> before we comment, let's think about this. This is November the 4th. This man has raped, shot 10 times, dismembered, or tortured, dismembered, cremated, Teresa Horbach, and burnt her electronics in the burn barrel just behind him. And this is November the 4th, and the reporter is talking to him. Now, Siders on November the 7th found the burnt electronics in the burn barrel. And there's another little clip in which a guy is talking to Stephen, I think on November the 4th, and you can see the burn pit in the background. Clearly, Stephen has not cleaned anything up. He's got all this incriminating evidence right next to him, and he's talking to different reporters. Now, from I know I want to hear from people in chat. Has he indicated any form of stress that he has just committed this horrible, horrible act on Teresa Horbach? while leaving the forensic evidence out in the open. I'd love to get your opinion. Just Rhonda, what do you think? I'm, I'm sorry, I was uh, sending a message to Jamie Hart <laughs> in chat. Hi, Jamie. <laughs> um, I apologize. I did not hear your question, Dot. Oh, the, the question is, did Stephen give any indications or clues to you that he had just oh. committed this horrible horrible rape torture shooting dismemberment cremation and leaving oh. all the forensic evidence out in the open and casually talking to no. reporters did he no. give you no. any hint any hint no no, no. there's nothing about in this clip or any of those other clips that we saw really early on, uh, there's nothing about him or his appearance or the, the look in his eye or his body movements or anything that uh, gave, gives me any clue or hint that he was involved in something so heinous just days before. Yep. No. Yep. Interesting. Interesting. Jack 60. Thank you, Jess Ronda. Jack 61. I have to agree with Rhonda. I don't see any indications. He's not nervous. He's not indicating. He's not. He's looking straight forward. He's not looking down and pitching back and forth. I don't see anything incriminating in this interview at all. Nothing. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, I don't recall. Did were you suspicious of anything? No, I would have thought if there was, you know, that incriminating barrel was incriminating. I mean, he would have been trying to hide it, like you know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, stand in front of it or something. But no. but isn't this the first time you notice that burn barrel right behind him? Well, it is. the moment I saw it, I go, oh my god, it's got burnt stuff from Teresa in that burn barrel, and he's talking to the guy next to the garage. Oh my god, that's horrible. The, the burn pit with Teresa's cremains allegedly in there, and he's talking casually. Hands in his pocket, gave no clue. Uh, I don't recall any other comments. 
All good? Yes, I'm good. Yeah. Neverly, what about yourself? Did did Stephen give any indication of him committing this horrible crime to None you? None whatsoever. It was actually when I watched it for the first time, I remember this interview and I'm like, he just seems normal and sincere. No, and like way too talkative and polite about the whole thing. But now that you described, and now that we know, you know, 20 more years later, uh, through the investigation and um, what you just described you know, about the burn barrel with Teresa's remains in there and the burn pit. Oh my God. Oh my God. No. Yeah. It would be. Pff, no. Okay. Okay. Uh, what about you, so Susan? I've said this before. If, if Stephen Avery is guilty, the man deserves an Oscar for acting all the way through phone calls, court, everything. He's one hell of an actor if he's guilty. I'll say that. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, and that's why Ken Kratz has labeled Stephen a psychopath, right? Because when you think, and I want Jack 61 to play this clip again, if you can. Can you play this clip again now that I've let out the, the cat out of the bag? Can you play the clip again and focus... Oh, Focus yep, absolutely. very carefully on the burn pit and the burn barrel and where Stephen is standing. Stephen is standing right next to the van that Teresa Horbach had photographed. And you could tell by his body language, the way he behaves, he's completely clueless. Completely clueless. Let's play the clip again. Uh, back it up here. Yeah, awesome. Going on there. And then, you know, the whole thing blew up. CBS 5's Alga Haliberta tells us this missing person's case involves a strange twist. I don't know if I'm a suspect, you know, I don't know. The more senior reporter, she and another photographer said, you're never gonna believe where this woman went. And they said, Stephen Avery's. And I said, what? She's a freelance photographer and was working for the Auto Trader magazine Monday taking pictures of used cars up for sale. You saw her leave? Yeah. You, tell me about that. Well, she took a picture and she writes down the serial number. Uh, she collects the money. Then she goes to her car and turns around and leaves. She wasn't there no more than well, five minutes. The Two Rivers man was wrongly convicted of sexual assault in 1985, but exonerated with DNA evidence in 2003. Now, two years later, he again finds himself tied to a police investigation. I said, this guy's got some bad luck. I'm like, this is crazy. I remember it being a shock, a statewide shock that this guy who just months earlier was this hero, was the prime suspect in the disappearance and likely murder of a young woman. Wow. Wow. And Susan, you're correct. There has to be two Stephen Averys, right? You think about it. Did Stephen actually prevent Remica and Link from checking his trailer on the same day? No. He said, come on in, check it out. No. So not only that, think about it. He's standing right in the middle of the crime scene, literally. Burn barrel, burn pit, where Teresa's car was, his trailer, and the garage. Everything. He's literally, literally standing right in the middle. You look at his body language and the way he spoke, does that indicate that he's trying to hide something or the guy's completely clueless? What does it indicate to you? To me, I, it indicates a guy that's got no idea what's about to unfold. That's the impression I got. Yeah, I got the same one, same impression. And not only that, Jack 61, up above the sky was an aeroplane flying over the Avery Salvage Yard for 18 minutes on November the 4th, the flyover. The guy looks casual. He looks normal. He doesn't look stressed. And what does he do one day later? He leaves for Crivets. Yeah. Right. 
and compare Please this interview. I'm sorry, Dr. Silkman. No, 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 go for it, Nibali. Compare this interview with Stephen and his demeanor to uh, what's his name? That Watts guy? What's his name? Chris Watts, who Chris killed Watts. his wife and two pregnant wife and two kids when he was just standing there, arms crossed on his chest and he yes. was like yeah i miss my family i want him back you know and he like everybody was like what the heck is going on over here it was so odd the words were there but the meaning wasn't correct so, right correct. yeah now uh, jack th thank you nivoli jack 61. Uh, oh, oh i'm sorry uh, not to me okay now just sum up before we before we continue right <clears throat> let's let's assume make the assumption that what Stephen is saying is 100 percent correct that the guy is innocent so put yourself in his shoes he sees Teresa come to the property take photographs he pays her she leaves put yourself in his shoes if he's innocent, that's all he knows. Would you agree? That's all he knows. He knows nothing else. Would you agree, guys? Oh, I, that's, I, I, yeah, I definitely agree. He, he didn't know what the hell's going on. If that's his truth, that's what he did, then he's got no idea. I saw her leave, right? So he's got no idea. Stephen has maintained the same story. little bit of changes, I agree when he's done affidavits for Kathleen Zorn, but the principle of his story has always been the same. Teresa came, took photos, I paid her, she left. So if he's truly innocent, then he's got no idea. If this occurred and, St and Stephen saw Teresa Horbach leave, Brendan Dassey is also clueless. Would you agree, guys? The kids Complete. got... Completely no clueless. involvement at all because no. Teresa left one hour before he arrived. Would you agree? Yep. Yep. Completely agree. So, yep. So if you look at Brendan's story and narrative, it is completely jumbled up nonsense and cannot be backed up by forensic evidence. Nothing, which tends to suggest that what Stephen is saying is un unless Stephen is the biggest psychopath the world has ever seen that makes Hannibal Lecter look like a, a, a an amateur because Stephen Avery spoke willingly to reporters day and night, standing right in the middle of the crime scene. No one said, oh, Stephen, what, what's that smell? And imagine if a reporter said, oh, do you mind if I have a look around? Can you show us in the uh, pit area? Can you take us for a drive, you know, blah, blah, blah. Nothing. Stephen was open, honest, and let the detectives, Lenk and Remaker, inside his trailer, where allegedly all this mayhem took place. So therefore, Stephen was completely, and they all said it, he was completely complimentary. Yeah, come in, go, go, check whatever you want. So to me, looking at that clip, I'm there, oh my God, this guy's clueless. He's got no idea. And Neverly, did you have a comment? Well, people are commenting about Stephen. Why was he doing those interviews? To me, he was, um, he thought, just to me, my interpretation is that he thought he had nothing to hide. So na Correct. he naively agreed to talk to the media because he had nothing to hide. He didn't have to talk to the media. It would be more suspicious if he said, I don't want to talk to you. No, so show me a warrant, yeah. come over. But he didn't do any of that. Correct. Yeah. And as far as him being uh, the biggest psychopath, well, you know, Kratz thinks Stephen is the biggest psychopath. Isn't that convenient to justify Stephen's behavior, to call him the biggest psychopath? That That's the only way they can explain it. And it's interesting on Mind Shock, they keep on talking about, and also Kathleen Zellner, there's an idiot and there's a savant. There's two of them. One is a complete merciless killer and the other one's completely clueless, right? Now, think about it. You've got reporters, police, 
an aeroplane flying overhead, obviously checking out the pit for the RAV4. And Stephen is nonchalant. He's got, he's hiding nothing. And in his mind, think about it. If he committed this crime, he's got Teresa's burnt electronics literally behind him. He's got Teresa's cremains literally next to the garage. Someone could walk in the trailer and potentially notice something, or someone can drive in the pit and find the RAV4, right? So he's sitting right in the middle of a horrendous crime scene, and no reporter ever says to him, do you notice that funny smell? Nobody. And anyone was free to walk around and potentially see the cremains. So think about this. From the first, second, third, fourth, and potentially half of the fifth, he had family members at the salvage yard that could have easily walked up to the burn pit and thought, what the hell are these bones doing here? Right? No one and no one noticed nothing, including the RAV4. Right? From the 31st, no one noticed the thing. And Stephen's body language to me indicates the guy is completely clueless. Just an opinion. Guys, do we have any comments? I have one that yes. probably deserves adding in, and, and that's the phone call between uh, Rimmaker and um, I think it was Herman, that, that 5 a.m. call where he's explaining to him this incident, him and Link going over to Avery's uh, and saying, you know, uh, we you know did this, that. I don't think the guy's not done. My gut feeling is the guy's not involved. Rimmaker was very straight about that. 100% correct. So somehow... I don't know how someone of Stephen's demeanor and character and intelligence was able to fool everybody. That's right. Everybody, right? And the moment I saw that image with the burn barrel right behind him and the burn pit right next to him in close proximity, I thought, oh, my God, how on earth did Stephen pull this off, right? It's well, remarkable. that brings up another question that, you know, I don't have any real life experience, but, you know, um, just thinking about what you commented earlier, that burn pit, I'm, you know, at that distance, I'm guessing, what, they're probably 30 yards, maybe 40 yards from the burn pit. If it wasn't that far. Yeah, it wasn't that far. And now we're talking the fourth, so we're basically five days after the fact that this actual cremation happened. Correct. Wouldn't it have stunk like hell? I mean, just, I don't know. Well, the like I said, the highest concentration of death odorants is right there in the burn pit. Right. Stephen never dug it out. He never removed all the ashes. It's no. right there. No one said, what the hell is that awful smell? And did you notice? In the background, you can actually see Bear. Bear was chill. Right. Didn't give Bear a damn. Was chill. He didn't give a damn. <laughs> Right? Yeah. And you're thinking, yeah. wait a minute, there's a dog there, a German shepherd there, not reacting. Susan. That smell all just floated over to the berm. Apparently. Susan, that can get you into a lot of trouble without comment. <laughs> I, I didn't feel your eyes rolling or anything, Susan. I'm just saying. Correct. But did Correct. you hear the I did. voice? <laughs> yeah, I felt your eyes rolling all the way over here. Correct. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's in it's interesting, right? In terms of being fair, I never once heard anyone from Cam say, Hey, look, let's have a balanced approach at this, right? Let's have a look at the good points, let's have a look at the bad points, the things that make Stephen look bad, the things that make him look not guilty. Oh, no, 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 no. The focus was to destroy him, his character, and to point you in the direction, of course this guy's guilty. What the hell are you talking about, right? So it's interesting that now if you start looking at these clips before the uh, before the RAV4 was found, I think they're priceless. They really tell you a lot. And from everything I've seen, um, Stephen has remained calm, cool, 
collective, he appeared to be completely clueless. Right? Completely clueless. Uh, Jack61, shall we play the next clip, please? Yep. Uh, unless uh, there's any, any comments. I have yeah. a question. Um, Evelyn. Dr. Silkman, I know you're uh, Italian by heritage. I know you live in Australia. Mm. But now you're turning into this Latin thing. It says, Dr. Silkman, foul play team. Quasimus yeah. veritatem. The, is that like the truther at heart in Latin? No, it, it's actually Latin for searching for the truth. Oh, okay. I knew that this uh, second word Search is truth. truth. Yeah. Yep, correct. Okay. Uh, there's different there's different there's different ways to spell to actually say the Latin phrase searching for the truth. This is one of them. Susan. What how do you say that, in Latin uh, uh what do you call it? Hijacked, hijacked <laughs> amygdala. That's right, I'm gonna get the Latin version <laughs> of hijacked amygdala. Correct. Correct. Sorry, I Susan. Just, I would I I would describe truthers as people searching <clears throat> for the truth. Correct. Correct. No, we don't have to be a conspiracy. This, this thing about being conspiracy theorists um, is, in my opinion, complete garbage, right? Uh, if there's police involvement, is if there's a family member involvement, that's not a conspiracy. That's people acting maliciously, right? That's right. But to me, to me, looking at that clip or the clips, Stephen appeared to be clueless. He had no freaking idea what was about to happen to him, right? Would you agree? Yep. He had no idea because if he did, if he did, he would have said, oh, look, I've got a bad headache. I'm not going to Crivets today. Uh, I've just got a little bit of work to do around here. Hey, if he saw the airplane flying uh, up above, uh, I think he would have been clued in that, uh-oh, they're looking at me. They're coming to talk to me, right? So you would have, he would have been clued up to think, oh, jeepers, I better, I better do something because something's about to happen, of course. Pam of God came, found the RAV4, all hell broke loose. Jack 61. Oh, I, I completely agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Shall we play the second clip? If you're ready. I got it. I got it queued up. Let's go for it, guys. Right, here we go. Clip two. Authorities say Stephen Avery's 16-year-old nephew admitted his involvement in the rape and murder of Teresa Hallbuck. Brendan Dassey is, to me, the most tragic figure in this entire case. When it was revealed that Avery's nephew was not just a witness, but also a pretty willing accomplice, that was a massive surprise. Brendan really gutted me. He was like a lamb led to slaughter. He really was. I thought, this is horrible what's happening to this 16-year-old boy who is deficient in his cognitive abilities. Easily the most sympathetic character that Making a Murderer introduced was Brendan Dassey. Even the people that were convinced that Stephen Avery was in fact guilty thought, mm, with Brendan Dassey it's a little bit different. The idea that this obviously limited young man is going to get involved with some kind of rape and murder, it just makes no sense. And then to have him interrogated the way he was. Brendan. Yeah. What else did you guys do? Come on. What he made you do, Brendan. You see how they interrogate him, and then all the facts that come out, how they feed him everything. That's all I can remember. All right, I'm just going to come up and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Who shot her? Oh, he did. Because they were telling him, just tell the truth and you'll be fine. Of course a kid's going to say that. He had no chance against them in that situation. He was going to lose, and he was going to lose every time. Now, you look at this clip, and you go, shit, these guys are using their brains, right? You, when I looked at that clip, I thought, oh, my God, they've woken up. Of course it's all bullshit. You see what they said? We can't possibly believe that Brendan was going to get involved in this and Brendan was going to go in, involved in that. And uh, Rookie even said, talking about, oh, look, you know, what did you expect him to say, right? And you can see that we get Fassbender, we're using the read technique on Brendan. They're getting very close, and Jack61 will comment, they even touched him on his knee. That's part of the read technique, get in a person's face. Make sure that they're focused on you, 
not diverting their attention. And when you looked at that clip, you go, oh, my God, they've woken up. They can see that it's all pure garbage. But that's a false impression because they went after Brendan and they went after him hard. And for Candace to say, oh, ma'am showed a sympathetic character. <laughs> I just could not believe what I was actually hearing. Jack sixty one, do you have any comments? Well, yeah, you know, absolutely. With uh, Brendan, uh, I think that the uh, crowds knew that they needed more because the Correct. what they had was really shaky, yeah, and questionable. I think a beating a string could have really attacked it, and they may have even gotten into some other areas uh, until the Brendan thing took place. Um, Brendan was a pawn he was a pawn correct and they they you know as soon as they elicit well you know another thing about the read techniques that a lot of people don't really understand and, and you know if you watch a lot of actual documentary cop shows you know they they explain to you that using this these techniques they don't really call it technique on, on, in these shows but they, they just say using police techniques they do it when they don't have evidence and they trying to get they're trying to elicit a statement and uh, you know even if it's an incriminating statement they, that's they're after a statement because they don't have proof so Correct. And, and they did it so badly uh, it it's a wonder it worked but brendan was you know to his credit he's really slow i don't mean that in a disrespectful way it's just who he is you know at that time in his life he just was a slow child um, I, I thought it was really, um, really terrible. But the real truth is, it was actually far worse than what was ever shown in Ma'am. It was far worse. I'll leave it at that and let other people talk comment. I hundred percent agree. But the way, the way, and I want, I want you to play the clip again and and have a listen to what Candice sort of said. Her flippant nature, right? This is a 16-year-old kid, right? His whole life is destroyed, right? Now, if he is falsely accused, as in it was a false confession, right, that kid is likely going to die in prison for something he never did, right, for something he never did, for just his words, Jack 61. I, I completely agree with that. This, Correct. Yeah, because he, he's really screwed because – for whatever reason, our criminal justice system puts these um, tight claims on words spoken when it's uh, when it can inc incriminate you. But when you come in, you know, late the, the juror never saw the last hour and a half of this March 1st coerced confession when Barb came in and Brendan says they got in my head. That's my I head. Really, yeah, I don't really understand why. I'll never understand why Edelson and Brendan agreed to not show that. I'll Sorry. never understand. So, it, uh, and I've said it before, and I'll get to Susan in a second. Everything that could go wrong for Brendan did, from his attorneys, everything, uh, to them getting rid of the his ability for a pre-trial. Everything went wrong for that poor kid. Uh, Susan, well, and, and we'll, yeah. I'm sorry. Just one more thing. We can't forget what did what did Ken Kras do the day after, before Brendan had ever even spoken to a lawyer. Or probably maybe he might have talked to Barb or, or, or an adult. But I don't know that because they arrested him on the spot. He goes on TV for a 20 minute press conference and destroys this kid's presumption of innocence right then. Correct. Completely. Correct. The um the the press conference was the major turning point. Uh, after that, they were both doomed. Uh, Susan, do you have a comment? Well, I just wanted to say the way they cherry picked Brendan's interviews, interrogations, whatever. Um, it, you know, to understand the coercion of Brendan, you have to start at the beginning and yes. you have to watch all of it. You do to understand what happened there, but they're, they're giving after they had gone through all of this and got Brendan to say what he said, that's what they're showing in cam. Oh, correct, correct. And the results the, of the coercion. Yeah. Yes, correct. And uh, you're one hundred percent correct. You you cannot cherry pick a statement here or a statement there, because um, as I said, 
jokingly one day, you can make Brendan Dassey look completely like a serial killer, you know, a demented serial killer if you take certain uh, statements that he said and put them together and cherry pick them and you can make him out to be one of the worst mass murderers out. Or well, if you look at... Plainly sorry, guilty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You can make him look really, really guilty. But if you see the whole thing in total, you see for what it is, complete, utter garbage. The kid has got no idea what the hell is going on. He guessed a lot. And plus, Fassbender and we get were steering him into the direction that they wanted to go. Once they cobbled the story together, that's it. They said, thank you. We've got our guy. Right? And that's where Cam guy. took all their clips from, that cobbled together story. 100% uh, correct, right? And again, Cam never had um, a professional come on and say, look, the reason why he's, um, uh, the way he was interrogated was so wrong and so bad that it solicits false confessions is because of this, 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 and this. There was none of that balance, right? No, but Andy Hale did come on and say, hey, if you're going to complain about the read technique, that's a whole different uh, issue. In a, in a later <laughs> yeah. episode, in a later yeah. episode, I just about, no. so in other, word, in other words, sorry, Susan, in other words, they're happy, but they're not happy. They're happy they got the confession, but the manner in which they got the confession, they know it's mm. completely fucked. Sorry for swearing, yeah. but they know it's wrong, it's bad, why do the damn thing? Right? Yeah. Sorry, Susan. Yep. Would, shall we shall we play that clip one more time? Shall we? Watch uh, I, it? Yeah. They're I, running, they're yeah. Oh yeah. I, yeah. 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 I can. Yeah. I can. Hold on. Uh, if there's right any up. questions, let us know in chat. Let's let's play it one more time. All right. Here we go. Thank you, Jack sixty one. Authorities say Stephen Avery's 16 year old nephew admitted his involvement in the rape and murder of Teresa Hallbuck. Brendan Dassey is to me the most tragic figure in this entire case. When it was revealed that Avery's nephew was not just a witness, but also a pretty willing accomplice, that was a massive surprise. Brendan really gutted me. He was like a lamb led to slaughter. He really was. I thought, this is horrible what's happening to this 16-year-old boy who is deficient in his cognitive abilities. Easily the most sympathetic character that Making a Murderer introduced was Brendan Dassey. Even the people that were convinced that Stephen Avery was in fact guilty thought, mm, with Brendan Dassey it's a little bit different. The idea that this obviously limited young man is going to get involved with some kind of rape and murder, it just makes no sense. And then to have him interrogated the way he was. Brendan? What else did you guys do? Come on. What he made you do, Brendan. You see how they interrogate him, and then all the facts that come out, how they feed him everything. That's all I can remember. All right, I'm just going to come out and ask you, who shot her in the head? He did. Who shot her? Oh, he did. Because they were telling him, just tell the truth and you'll be fine. Of course a kid's going to say that. He had no chance against them in that situation. He was going to lose, and he was going to lose every time. He said, Dave, Dave said probably one of the rightest things he said the entire series, he was screwed. Yep. Yep, 100% One, correct. So you could tell Brendan Dassey had a great effect on all of them, even these hardcore guilters, right? So how were they going to justify Brendan Dassey? And the reason, the, the way they justified Brendan Dassey was that evil Uncle Stephen coerced Brendan Dassey into committing a rape, torture, uh, being involved in shooting. Brendan Dassey never talked about dismemberment because he had no idea. And also cremation and getting rid of her RAV4, right? So that's the way they justified it. They blamed Stephen for everything. And so we've got this issue whereby they knew these guys, you could tell by watching the clip, they knew that something was not right here. 
a young man, 16 years old, mentally challenged, mentally impaired, slow, never been in trouble with the law, never been in trouble with the teachers. I don't even think his brothers have said one bad thing about Brendan. Brendan loved to play video games, be by himself. He's a loner type of kid. And for him to be involved and coerced, think about it, of raping a 25-year-old woman who he's never met in front of his uncle and then going back, going back and then being involved in disposing of Teresa Horbach's body, it honestly, it makes no sense whatsoever. So you have a kid who has never been in trouble who has now committed murder 101 and rape 101, all in the spate of coming home from school. Uh, I find that hard to believe. What do you think, I do guys? Too. I do too. Well, I, 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 I just don't believe this cobbled together story that, that they did. And But again, I think this is totally in um, Kratz Arena because, you know, of events that happened later as well. But, you know, we have to remember what led up to this event the the uh, federal the, the the civil lawsuit gets uh settled yes and then they're they're continuing it they're still they've already interviewed jody they're going after her hard to try to get her to flip and she's just taking their cigarettes and their pop and sandwiches and you know going and you know this this feigning madness that gets at steve she's listening to these phone calls between steve and and debbie she didn't she never flips but they continue to try to get her. Well, then she finally says, look, leave me the hell alone. I don't want to talk to you people anymore. I didn't, I don't know anything. So they're continuing to go after fam- people that are close on that yard. And Brendan, which they knew from no, at least November 2nd or 3rd, that he was over. He had said he was over there. That They knew that. It was in the one of the phone, maybe two of the phone calls. Right. So, I think they uh, saw this opportunity and they took it. Correct. But but now can you see what uh, convicting a murderer has done, right? They presented Brendan Dassey as the poor sacrificial lamb. Yep. And you watch now. They go after Stephen big time, <laughs> big time. Shall we have a look at the next clip, uh, Jack61? Absolutely. Clip three. So, so now ev- everyone everyone is feeling very sympathetic, very bad for Brendan Dassey. And now about to blame Stephen for everything. The way they did it was incredible. So let, let's have a look at uh, the next clip. All right. Here we Again, go. Clip three. Number one. Yep. Yeah. Here we go. He's just a ragtag, run around, have a good time type of kid. Foul Play is a group of Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey supporters. Slide number six, I want to hear your comments. This is looking like the beginning of his mischief. (laughs) So I'm really excited today just to have this opportunity to talk to this group of truthers. I'm curious to know how much they've dug into the case and why they believe Stephen and Brendan are innocent. My name is Dr. Silkman. Neverly. Bibi. Linda. Jack. Sammy. Susan. And Zoe. I want to start with whoever wants to go first about their thoughts about his burglaries and anything, really anything about it. Well, basically, I mean, you know, peer pressure. Hey, why don't we just go break in here and grab some beers and steal some money. Personally, I don't see it as more than that, but there may be information that I don't have. It starts when Avery was just 18. He and a friend broke into this bar on Harps Lake. They show you this report in Making a Murderer, but what they show you is very little of what actually happened. I really ain't got much on my record. Two burglaries with my friends. We just rode around to get something to do. Rob and Avery actually broke into the bar three times. The first time, important to note, he was alone. 
He broke the window and the owner then patched it up with some cardboard. The second time, Avery ripped off the cardboard and the owner patched it back up with some plywood. The third time, Avery ripped the plywood right off and he got back in through the window. His prior burglaries, he explained as, or the documentary explained as, being $14 and a sandwich, which was highlighted on the screen so everybody could see. So on November 6th, they stole the sandwiches, the $14, whatnot, right? They came back on the 8th. He didn't just take $14 worth of quarters and a sandwich and a beer. He trashed the place. Nothing on that page is included in making a murder. It seemed very much that the documentary was trying to minimize Stephen's criminal history. Everything that he did was somehow soft served. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> now, do we, do we have any comments? It's funny looking at, at ourselves three years ago, right? <laughs> it is. Um, you you know, well, I mean, th this is their... You know, unbeknownst to us, this was a, uh, a a coordinated effort to show how bad a, a guy Stephen was. But it's still just burglary. There's a lot of people that rob right. other places and people that are not murderers. So this was their ground ground floor of him going back in and they trashed the place. Which again, maybe Ma'am should have shown it, but again, to me, it wouldn't have made him. It wouldn't have mattered. It, it, it's burglary, and I, it, it's nothing more than that. And they're trying to make it more than that. Uh, correct, correct. But uh, this is where Brenda took us, right? We're, yeah. We're, we're looking at each other, thinking, "Wait a minute, aren't we meant to be talking about the murder about case? case?" Yeah. Right. And you notice what both Brenda and Candace said? Oh, they left it out. They left it out. But the thing is, this occurred in the early 80s. There was a police report. I think he either got fined or he got jail time. So he served his sentence, right? What Candace and Brenda were complaining about is that they didn't hit Stephen hard enough in MAM. They wanted to say, oh, yeah, he took a sandwich. But do you notice what Candace said? Oh, he took off the window. Oh, he came back. He took off, he ripped off the cover this time. Oh my God, he came back and he trashed the place. Stephen was convicted and charged and served his time. But Candace and Brenda weren't happy that to uh, keep on honing in and yeah. amplifying what he did. He did a burglary. What he did was completely stupid. He paid the price, went to jail. I, I believe he went to jail, prison, did prison time for it. And that's it. That's on his record. But somehow they weren't happy with Ma'am that they didn't include all the juicy details of what he did when he was, what, in his early, what was he, early 20s? Not even. Oh, he was quite. Yeah. Yeah. He was born in 62, I think, a year after us, Doc. Correct. So, Correct. So he, uh, he, he wasn't even, I guess he's probably 18 or 19 years old. He was quite young. He was quite young. All right. Does anyone have any comments? Jamie Susan. was just asking, were many of you on the panel interviewed by this chick from Cam? Was it uh, just the four of us? Oh, no, there was. It Beverly. depended on the day. No, but I mean, it right was, now on this panel. Oh, it's four of us. Rhonda and yeah. Cherie were not there, right? No. I was no. there for the last one. I wasn't. Okay. <laughs> yep. Okay. Correct. Uh, yeah, uh, both Neverly, myself, Jack61, and Susan, uh, we were there for most of the days. And you can see Linda and BB, uh, they were there too, and Zoe. So, yeah, uh, it's, and yeah. Sammy, yep, it was a blast on the past. But, uh, yeah, we were we were looking at each other thinking, why, why is Brenda focusing here? And now you understand what her ulterior motive was. Her ulterior motive was to drive Stephen to the ground, destroy him, destroy him, what he did when he was a young man, right? Completely take him apart. Does anyone have any comments? Susan? Destroy him and ma'am. Oh, answer. correct, correct, yeah. correct. But, but not only that, that ma'am somehow was remiss by not including all the details of what he did. Right. 
So in other words, could you imagine, ma'am, having to read out all the police reports just to satisfy the audience? Oh, yeah, Stephen did this, he did this, he did this. How about saying he got convicted of burglaries, got fined, got sentenced to prison, that's it. They weren't, con they weren't content with that. No, Jackson, I wouldn't. Yeah, you know, and there was also a story. Uh, I remember this from a couple of months ago. Maybe you guys remember, too. There was a story floating around out there that they had somehow gotten hold of Stephen's school records and stuff when he was a juvenile. I don't know how that that could have possibly happened because those were sealed. I don't know if it's true or not. I just remember this. Uh, I'll call it a rumor. Um, but. I think that pretty well nuts it up, what you said, Doc. He, he he did some stupid stuff that he shouldn't have done. We've all admitted he's he's not going to win a citizenship award. Again, no. where there are millions of people in the world, a hundred, certainly hundreds of thousands here in the United States, that have done burglaries that are not murderers. And well, <laughs> remember, remember when we did the uh, reading – sorry, Susan. Remember when we did the Reading with the Crew podcast? And I showed you all the crime statistics, yeah. right? There were thousands of burglaries, right? Yes. Uh, and you can look at it at each year, thousands of them. That's right. The focus is on Stephen's burglaries. Why? Because their character assassinating him. Their well, whole idea is that he's such a bad guy. Of course, he killed Teresa Hallbach. He had to have. There's um, another side of that, and I like Susan talk. There's another side to this too, and I, again, I don't know what all uh, the filmmakers uh, open records requested, but there were a lot of things that the state did too that they didn't they didn't put in there that would have looked really shitty for them, like really fucking bad. Pardon my French, and they didn't include it. They didn't include that either. So it, it it's a fifty fifty bar here, and they don't want to acknowledge that at all. I also want to say that Stephen treated women like shit. Okay, agree. He did. He, agree. And so did so did both of his brothers. I mean, agree. That's Correct. how Chuck they were. Chuck, Chuck was worse. Chuck is Chuck scary. Chuck was worse. Yeah. He's scary. And you know, Earl has nothing to be proud of at all. No. No. So not at all. Um, but again. What does that have to do with the murder of Teresa Hobbock? That's exactly right. I mean, there's millions of men in this world that are abusers to women. Correct. And they're not murderers. But so, you see, when that statement, <clears throat> they use it against us. They say that we are justifying his behavior. No, no. That's the problem. No, of course no. we are not. Of <laughs> course we are not. We're just stating the fact that not every... <laughs> Wife beater is a murderer. He was absolutely horrible to women. Yes, and, agree. You know, Chuck was agree. worse. Just saying. Yep, agree. Yeah, they 100%. were all bad. But Correct. like I say, there's millions of men on this planet that do that and worse, and they don't murder people. No, correct. No, but you see, you see, this was to sow the seeds of doubt in us, right? Because what did Brenda say? I want to find out how much the foul play team knows, right? Yes. So we're, we're thinking, okay, let's talk about the case, what had happened, the forensic evidence, or no. Oh, no. We, we, got, dragged, we got dragged back in 1981 or 1982, right? And we're thinking, well, what's the purpose there? The purpose there is to basically saying, look, you're supporting this guy of all the bad things that he did. Do you realize what you're doing? And we're thinking, we never said that we condone what Stephen did. None. I, As a male, I am ashamed of his behavior. Does it mean that he killed Teresa Horbach? No, it does not. And that's why we've got to be very careful because what they're trying to do is to say that Stephen is such a bad character he had to have been the killer. That's the danger. And yes. that's, why, that's why Kratz wanted to bring all his past, say, see, that's why he killed Teresa Horbach, because they can't work out a motive. They can't work out what, why would he kill Teresa Horbach? What's the motive behind doing that? 
And you know what Sean Rex said when he did the podcast with the uh, smoke screen? Is because sexually he needed to have sex and he couldn't wait and he probably got a rejection from Teresa Horbach. So he had to rape her, kill her, cremate her, get rid of her body, get rid of the rap fall. I'm thinking to myself, what? He was going about to see, wasn't he about to see Jody the day after? Take it to, I think it was the Alcoholics Anonymous. Yes. Uh, her, that, her, her Huber, Huber class. Her Huber. Yeah, the day and, after. And Doc, yes. and I know I don't need to say this to anybody because I'm sure that most people know this. Rape has nothing to do with sex or wanting no. sex. No. no. So that is, no. what a fucking asshole for him to say that. That's oh, what he sorry, said on the screen. That, I yes. He, and him. nobody called him an asshole because that is, like, that uh, is a, that is, well, okay, well. Yeah. He basically said that he couldn't. That he couldn't, is ridiculous. That he James couldn't. Somebody with his, uh, with his alleged level of intelligence to, to say something so ludicrous in such a public way. Uh, I just that I can't even imagine. I'm glad I didn't listen to it. That's all I can say. But well, but James the, Crane's. Oh, no, go for it. James Crane uh, said in the chat, "Not every murderer is a wife beater." Boom! There you go. That's one point that uh, that uh, I I think it's really excellent. And then another thing I wanted to say uh, about what Rhonda just said if we go by that then what then everybody no wonder that many people think that Kratz had something to do with this taking into yes. consideration his own I've history that. I've heard that his too. own history right yes and then going back a little bit to Cam what, what Jamie Hart asked he uh, he had a question and he goes were the interview questions she had for you all very vague or made to make you all look in, unintelligent? That is what I expect from the other side anyway. Okay. It so when in our minds, we wanted to talk about the Holba case. Correct. So we were kind of brushing off the burglaries, the cat, although we fought over the cat, fucking cat issue and stuff. But that's why we were like, no, 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 yeah, yeah, he did all of that, but we wanted to get on with the Holbach issue. The Holbach case, correct, correct. Yeah, and then they use that like we are condoning what was happening. So what you see on TV, just like they were accusing ma'am, same with Cam, it's not what actually happened. Correct, 100% correct, yep. Guys, do we have any other comments? Um, Rhonda, do we have questions? Uh, we, I don't think we do, but uh, no, there haven't really been questions. Just everybody comments. commenting, commenting, commenting co comments. Yeah. 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 Guys, yeah. well, I I like Jim Crane so, says. Who cares if they set him up? He needs to be locked up because of all of his past. Oh, yeah. I think they're saying that, you know. Yeah. Oh, okay. I was like, I, I was confused. Well, you guys, I have mentioned this several times before, and it involves a case from Oklahoma City um, years and years and years ago. And um, a, a rapist and a, you know, a burglar, uh, just a horrible, horrible man was um, accused of murdering an elderly woman in Oklahoma City. And there was evidence to prove, well, what, DNA evidence to prove that it wasn't him. And uh, and this is Joyce Gilchrist stuff. So, you know, you have to kind of take it with a grain of salt anyway. But anyway, he was convicted, this, this, this rapist and burglar and, you know, all these crimes that this man had committed uh, was charged and convicted and sentenced to death for murdering this woman, this elderly woman. But after he was executed, DNA proved it was not him. 
uh, and that whole execution about, you know, the whole thing about executing an innocent man is, is, is a whole different topic. The point is just because, because Bob Macy's attitude about this man, um, sure he always has to remind me, Malcolm Rent was his name. Um, he, the whole point behind DA Bob Macy, his attitude was, well, you know what, even though, you know, we have proof now that he didn't murder this woman, he had all these other things in his past that he did do. And he served his time for those other crimes. I, he was a horrible man, a horrible individual. I don't care how horrible you are in your past life. It doesn't mean that you did whatever crime they're uh, accusing you, know, you of. Accusing you of to have having done. And here Correct. we have at least in Oklahoma City, and I'm sure in many other uh, states in the country, a man who was innocent of the crime, but executed anyway, because he had this horrible past that he had had hanging behind him. So the same thing, the same thing applies for Stephen Avery for me. He, all the things that he did, and like Susan said, you know, how, how horrible he was to women, and, uh, you know, how, just to some people in general, we, you know, we know of that, none of that, none of those prior bad acts mean that he murdered someone. And it pisses me off that Cam uses, that's all Cam has used, in my opinion, that I saw in the episodes that I character. watched. That's Correct. what they counted on. Yeah, that was what they used to, to, you know, say that, yep, he's wrong. He's, he's, he's a murderer. And I don't think that's right. That is not justice. It's, I wonder, sorry. sorry. No, go, go for it. Just as, of what you were talking about before, how they, when you were interviewed by them or whatever, they wanted to talk about the 1985 case, but not the murder. And um, I wonder if it's the same reason why Brenda or Sean or none, any, none of those want to come on alive to discuss this because they don't want to talk about that case, that part of the case. No, they don't. They can't hold up their own against it. No, <laughs> Just no, my no. You're correct. You're correct. 100% correct. When Sean said we didn't include the 1985 case because we we know that uh, he didn't do that one. I'm thinking to myself, wow. And if you watch the episodes in Cam, they're very, very quickly dismissive, especially Brenda. Her attitude was, oh, well, they made a mistake. It was Gregory Allen. No problems. No, no, no harm done. And it's rather amazing that the focus and spotlight was on Stephen's past crimes, which he paid a price, which he went to prison, and none of us argued, not one of us said, yeah, he was misunderstood. No, he's a terrible person, a scumbag, did not treat women well. We 100% agreed. But when things were in his favour, they quickly bypassed it, right? So, Jack61, I reckon we do one more clip because we've done over three hours because that way yeah. we've got a good chunk for tomorrow. Are you happy with that? Guys, Absolutely. everyone, because I think we've done we've covered quite a lot. We've done we've done a really good job. I think we do one more clip. It's only a short one. How about Alrighty. that? Yep, yeah, sounds good. Let's go for it, guys. All right, here's clip four. In Making a Murderer, they played this clip of Stephen explaining why he ran his cousin off the road. Like this is the only reason that the cops might have it out for him. And essentially it's because she's been talking bad about him around town. She was being a barfly, saying all these things, and it got back to Stephen. He was mad as hell. But what we don't hear in Making a Murderer is Sandra's side of the story. And the truth is that he didn't just run his cousin off of the road, point a gun at her, and ask her to please stop lying about him. He actually ordered her to get into his car. I was just shocked. This was going through my mind. Is he going to shoot me? I'm fearing for my child and front seat. Should I run? I don't know what I, what I should do. Why do the filmmakers minimize Stephen Avery's history of violence and abuse? 
He actually ran her off the road. He described as colliding. Why would the filmmakers make a woman who's been run off the road for doing absolutely nothing look like a villain? He exited his vehicle with a rifle, pointed at her, and ordered her to get into his vehicle. That's an abduction. Her daughter was in the car. They left that out completely. They pretty much make Stephen out to be the victim and her to be the perpetrator. It's sad. Stephen Avery had a very well-established pattern of abusing women. I remember her nose bleeding. They hit her against the wall. Why did you start writing her these letters? I mean, they're pretty scary. And I look in my rear view mirror and I see these headlights coming and they're coming really fast. Okay. Now, look at what I did, why I chose that clip, right? You notice the way they edited the ending of the episode, right? Accusation, 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 accusation. What did they show right at the end? Stephen Avery turning around smiling, right? Now, the the directors, producers of, con of convicting a murderer blamed the man for doing exactly the same thing. Remember Jack 61? Yep. Oh, creative editing, they left you on a cliffhanger, you wanted to come back and watch more. Tell me exactly. that that's not exactly what Cam just did. It's exactly what they did. They copied it. Uh, I mean, not verbatim, but a lot of the model of making a murder they used yep. in the convicting murder. Yep. If you play that clip again, what you'll see is accusation after accusation. And right at the end, what do you get? You have Stephen turning around smiling. Right. As if you think, this guy's a heartless bastard. He thinks he can get away with anything he wants. You must have no sympathy for him at all. That's the impression I got, guys. What do you think? That's absolutely what I think. But again understanding that he's an asshole to women and, and help pretty much to everyone. Let's, let's not sugarcoat it. Even to, you know, Dolores at times, Alan, he, he was just a, he was just a jerk. And that's not, that's not me minimizing anything at all. Correct. He should have been held accountable for what he did to Sandra Morris. It didn't matter if he was running around town, running her damn mouth. You don't do what he did to, you know, to address it. You, you do it in a different way. And Correct. he didn't, and he should have went to jail for the full six years, as far as I'm concerned, because it's Correct. wrong. You don't, you don't do that shit. Correct. And, and, and you know, one last thing I'll add: um, Sandra Morse didn't deserve what happened in that situation at all, but she's not innocent in the event that led up to it. She's not. So, I, I'm going to leave that there. Again, that shouldn't have happened. What he did, but she. She instigated it, and he reacted uh, in a way that he should have never done. That's my correct, opinion. correct, and a hundred percent agree. And we we argue with Brenda. I remember arguing with Brenda. Yeah, I'll tell you. And I'll tell you what the argument was about. Right, and we had read about the Sandra Morris incident. Um, we knew what had happened, and we all agreed one hundred percent. Stephen deserved jail time. What he did. You cannot condone. It was despicable, disgusting. I realize what Sandra was doing, egging him on. That's not the point. The point is you don't react in that manner, right? You don't follow someone, run them off the road, point a gun at them. It's completely, that's ridiculous. Now, this, the Sandra Morris incident destroyed Stephen completely. Why? Because it got piggybacked with what happened to Penny, and they targeted Stephen uh, for multiple reasons, but they put two and two together, and they accused him of the violent assault on Penny Bernston, and they were going to lock Stephen away for 32 years, and we know what happened, completely destroyed him. Now, we argued with Brenda, what Stephen did is reprehensible. You cannot condone it. He deserved to go to prison. But this is where I argued. This is where I argued vigorously with Brenda and also with Ricky. Brenda said to us, you realize that Stephen was going to rape 
uh, Sandra Morris. And we all looked at each other thinking, wait a minute, what are you talking about? Her argument was the reason why he wanted to put his cousin in the car was that he was going to sexually assault her and rape her. And we're there, wait a minute, you can't draw that conclusion. No that way. Never that never happened. Could you imagine? Now, all jokes aside, if Stephen put one hand on Sandra Morris, the MTSO would have come down with shotguns in hand. Stephen would have been pumped full of lead. Do you guys agree? Probably. Because her he was husband, a wife of an officer. Her husband worked in the MTSO and Stephen's uncle worked in the MTSO. They would have come down shotguns in hand. He was dead if Stephen had laid one hand on Sandra Morris. Brenda tried to convince us that that was his intentions to rape his own cousin. And we argued at least, I reckon, for half an hour saying, Brenda, he never did that. But notice and what Brenda was to do. There was, no, there was no evidence that he was even thinking about doing that. None. You know what the reason, you know where she was leading us. Oh, absolutely. To justify, to justify why the Kasserik and Vogel went after Stephen for yep. the assault on Penny Princeton. That's right. In other words, they were justified going after Penny, uh, Stephen attacking Penny because of uh, what he was trying to do to his cousin Sandra Morris. And we argued, no joke, I reckon, for an hour, saying, what the Probably. hell are you talking about? That's right. Yep, correct. Does anyone have any other comments? Um, T1, would it change your mind? Would it change your mind about Stephen's intent if the gun was loaded? Well, I'll tell you what's interesting. Stephen said that it was unloaded, but in the police report, I think it's penciled in that there was one cartridge in the chamber. Isn't that yeah. interesting? It is interesting. Yep. He said it was, no, 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 I left all the shells at home. Oh, I just wanted to scare her. But in the police report, there was one, one uh, a live round in the chamber according to what the officer wrote. Was it literally penciled in? Like, what, uh, I, I have to go back to the report, but you could see one like, it says one like round in the rifle. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. It's in, we, we've, we've got the documents on our site. So uh, very interesting. Correct. Answer, but what he answer, did. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, what he did, he, des he, he absolutely deserved jail time. Oh, and yeah. uh, we also welcome um, Henbury. He's in chat. Welcome, Henbury. Hey, Henbury. Yeah. Yeah, Jamie, or I uh, see, Anthony had a, a comment. Um, Brenda suggested that. Yeah, she did. This was during her, one of our interviews. Yeah. Um, I don't remember which one, but, yeah, it was a pretty uh, pretty intense argument because there's yeah. absolutely no proof that Stephen's intent was to um, sexually assault her. None that I'm aware of. No. Correct. And that that you, you won't see that in Cam, but we argued. No, no kidding. And I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, we are being led up the garden path here. Oh yeah. Yep. Let's, we talked let's, about let's, it. We we yep. we talked about it after we were done. I remember that. And yeah. the fact that he the fact he backed off when he found out. She had her the child in the car. Yeah, let her go. Because he's not a psychopath. Right. right? If he yeah. were a psychopath, he would have taken them and killed them both or raped them yeah. both or whatever. Jane, yeah. And many people say that it was an infant. It was, I think, a four or five-year-old. Yeah. It was not an infant in her car. Not that James that makes Crane. any difference, but I hear that a lot. Yes. James Crane says, I still don't know why they did not follow up more on the accusations of Sandra Morris was making about him. And that's exactly it. No matter what you say, it's like, hey, but she instigated this. She, she was bullying him, basically. 
And if you say, I can see how somebody could actually be so upset when somebody is spreading lies about you. And it's one uh, one thing that we know about Stephen. He does not bode well with that. When he's wrong, he says I'm wrong. When he says I did it, he did it. He even took, you know, the rap for the cat, even though he didn't do exactly what they were saying he was doing. So how, I mean, he's also a human being. If somebody was saying shit like that about me, I don't know what I would do. How do you resolve that? And this is his cousin. You're lucky. You're, you're lucky. You're not Italian in the mafia. I know exactly. How, <laughs> yeah, I know you know exactly what I mean. It's like yeah. this is yeah. just a bad situation. It's a his shocking. cousin, who is uh, taking advantage of the fact that she's untouchable, basically, because she's married to the sheriff or deputy sheriff, and uh, she's saying all those things. What do you do? Again, not condoning what Stephen did. But you no. can understand how things escalated. Well, but I if you say what, that, uh, easy. then you are an idiot. Then you are a monster for thinking, yeah, Stephen did something. And it's like, I could see how he did it. And that's yeah. exactly how they, to answer Jamie Hart's question from 30 minutes ago, that they were like egging us on with stuff like that. But uh, correct me, I agree, but correct me if I'm wrong. Judy Dvorak was a neighbor as well. Yes. And Judy Dvorak didn't like Stephen. And correct me if I'm yeah. wrong, but weren't there anonymous reports that Stephen was chaining up his own kids to yes. a tree? According to, G according mm -hmm. to Judy Dvorak and that, that, and, and that Stephen and Lori were having sex in the yard. And Judy correct. and Sandy were friends, right? Uh, yes. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yep, correct. So and there were no other witnesses. No, to no. what Sandra was saying. No, no, correct. So, in, in fairness, in fairness, Stephen definitely deserved to go to prison, right? Yes, no, no question. But he may have been let off earlier on a good behavior bond. He might have served three years, right? He might have served three years, but he would have gone back or less. Or less. He or would less. have gone back. Yep, or less. He would have gone back, been together with his family. He had five little kids and learned his lesson to say, right, and the judge would have said to him, you come in contact with Sandra Morris or her friends, you're going straight back to prison. You're willing yeah. to accept that? Yes, Your Honor. Which meant that his whole life wouldn't have been completely destroyed by now being piggybacked by the vicious assault on Penny Bernstein which completely unraveled him. And if you watch Cam, they've got no sympathy for Stephen whatsoever. Guys, would you agree? None. Completely agree. None. Zero. Completely agree. Zero. Yep. I want to read agree. a couple of I want to read a yes. couple of T1's comments. Yeah, let's go for sure. It. He says uh, originally Stephen denied the whole incident. But the LEO noticed his car hood was warm and the gun barrel was ice cold. Then Stephen admitted his guilt once he knew he was caught. I yep. think that's important. And then he says, I believe Stephen Avery is human and will deny guilt until caught. That's his MO. So why didn't he admit guilt after Brendan allegedly confessed to what he and Stephen did? Exactly. That's a good point. It didn't happen. Right. To your point. Right. right. And that's why that's why the police this the way I reckon it worked out, panned out. Fastbend and we get convinced Brendan that Stephen killed Teresa. Right? So he Brendan accepted it because remember, Brendan is quite pliable and whatever oh, very, whatever highly suggestible. Yep, whatever authoritative figures tell him, he believes, right? So he goes, okay, so, oh, my God, my uncle really killed Therese, but it couldn't have been when I was there, and somehow he got, he involved himself. Then what did the police say to him? You better be truthful, Brendan, because your uncle is going to blame you yep. for everything. And that's yep. why you up. That's why he said to his mother, what happens if Stephen has a different story to mine? That's right. How much time will I get for 
you know, cleaning the garage. Helping him clean the garage. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what the I'm hell, man? He's in prison. Am I going to get for helping him clean the garage? Right? So it's you got that's why you got to have the full story not little snippets that's right that you cherry pick right and that's exactly what cam did unfortunately not unfortunately for us we spent years going over everything so we know the narrative we know where the story uh, where they fit where all the things fit uh, cam never explained any of that at all and all they right? barely they barely even touched on uh, gregory allen and Oh no, they, they avoided Greg Allen. Yeah, because of what Gasorkin, Gasorkin Vogel, you know, basically just let him go. And he right. goes on to, to, you know, assault many different women, one bad in 1991. And then, of course, the, the other one he actually got caught for in 95. Uh, I mean, Shocking. damn, Barry. That, and that, that, that's why, when, because uh, we'll, we'll finish the podcast in a second, guys. I, I think we've done enough clips. Oh, but yeah. That's why, that's why when we were discussing this with Brenda, we're going, Brenda, don't you want to actually discuss the murder of Teresa Hobart? Let, let's discuss the forensic evidence. Let's talk about it. What have you got? Put, put your cards on the table. We'll, we'll discuss talk. She never even gave us documents that we wanted. No, she wouldn't, like, she wouldn't do she it. No. She literally waved one of the documents in front of my face about Stephen's exoneration, the DNA material that was done in Stephen's exoneration, wouldn't give it to me. We had no. to foyer ourselves. And what you see, right, Jack61, whenever she was interviewing the uh, so-called Av Avery Dassey supporters, <laughs> she... <laughs> She was sitting behind her computer with a whole stack of, of information. The people that she was talking to had nothing. Well, oh, nothing. yeah, absolutely. Nothing. And her op the, her office that she had set up there, that transition, I mean, she had her computer. Behind the computer was a a cabinet or, I mean, a wall, uh, yeah, wall top, open top cabinet that had like four or five shelves. It was full of her stuff. She had a uh, another cabinet off to the right. It was full of stuff and a box. That was Correct. full of note, notebooks and stuff. So, Correct. Whereas if we had the same documents on our computer screens, we can rebut, counteract. Yeah. Right? When she's got documents and we don't have them, we're going, okay, and now what are we going to say? Right? So it's not fair. Hand no. over what you've got. We'll read it. We'll analyze it. We'll talk about it. Don't. Level the playing field. Don't Level have this. Field. Yeah, don't have this one-upmanship. And you know, dangle this over here and say, "Well, I've got this," and well, okay, share it. Let's let's take a look at. It. No, 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 no. Correct, correct. Well, look, guys, um, fantastic podcast. I can't believe we did uh, three clips or four clips. I mean, four clips, we just, yeah. yeah, we discussed a lot, and I think, guys, the clips that I chose, I didn't want to be um, too too controversial, too messy. If you know what I mean. There was yeah. some stuff that was very highly private and I felt very uncomfortable even putting up the little clip. If you want to see them, um, just watch a Cam 1 and 2. I think they're free on YouTube. But yeah. tomorrow, uh, Jack61 will be presenting open mic and uh, we'll continue looking at those clips. Yeah, awesome. we've got four. Yeah, we've got four more to go yeah, through. Yeah. So, yeah. We can do that tomorrow. We can do yeah. that tomorrow. Absolutely. Well, look, guys. Well, look, guys. Thank you so much for being a great audience and thank you so much for your great questions. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this podcast. I think we gave a lot of due diligence to uh, the clips and we discussed the overall structure of what convicting a murderer was all about. And there's no doubt in my mind, I reckon they'll be doing a part two. What do you reckon, guys? There'll be a part two. Oh, um, God, I hope not. <laughs> I would you, be, could the, you could do the rebuttal this time. I, I, I honestly, yeah. I don't know. I don't know because, again, you know, we have to consider transition, the, the Daily Wire Plus. They're all for profit. And I, I just don't know what was made off of this. And clearly, I making a murder. Making a murder, definitely. Yeah, I can't either. I mean, the first episode, well, the first episode, I'm sure a lot of people watched, but after that, uh, I. We just don't know the st statistics of 
um, how many subscribers that daily the Daily Wire got um, versus how much they had to pay and so on and so forth. I, I just don't know. Maybe. Correct. Correct. All right, guys. Uh, well, look. I, oh, sorry. Excuse can me. I just ask a quick question? When we were interviewed by Brenda, was was that before Ma'am Two came out? No. No, it was after. It was after. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. It was after. Okay. Correct. And if you notice with uh, Cam, there's an, a total absence of Kathleen Zona. There's a very, very little mention of Kathleen Zona at all <laughs> because they're yep. really only dealing with Ma'am One. All right, guys. Well, um, shall we quickly go around the table and yep. say our goodbyes? Yep. Uh, um, just good. Rhonda. Yep, just Rhonda. Oh, um, well, yeah, it was great again, as always. And uh, again, I'm, I, you know, what we're doing here, what you guys are covering in the podcast is really all that I need to see of the, <laughs> of the, of the other yeah. scam thing, because it's just, I find it all very ludicrous and disgusting. And so everything that they said about, ma'am and the ways that they uh slammed ma'am for the for the way that they produced and edited and everything they did the same damn things and uh but they yes. did but they didn't have any backs to back they didn't show me the the few episodes i watched they didn't show me anything that i found uh you know newsworthy or enlightening i didn't find anything that i didn't know already or that I felt like made Stephen more likely to have been a, a killer. Um, and certainly, I, I mean, I won't even include Brendan because Brendan should, Brendan should never have been a part of it to begin with, I agree. Uh, but it is what it is. So um, I, before Jack tells me to plug myself, I'll just start plugging <laughs> away. Um, <laughs> we had a pretty wild, um, I haven't looked at the the stats uh, since Wednesday or Thursday, Wednesday morning, I guess. But we had a pretty wild um, podcast on my channel um, on Tuesday this last, or uh, uh, yeah, this last week. It was pretty graphic and pretty oh interesting to say the least. <laughs> uh, a lot of it was hard to read just because it was so vulgar and foul. It was X rated. Uh, it was X-rated, uh, and I mentioned, I don't know how many of you in the chat now were watching that night, but while I was personally reading some really graphic content from the trial transcript uh, that, that the accuser was saying, I noticed that my bedroom door had been opened, and, uh, and so I was like, I said in the middle of it, I said, oh my God, I need to pause you guys. I think one of my grandkids just came into my room. And at that very moment, I had twice had to repeat a line in the testimony that was very, very foul and very disgusting. And in, just so you guys know, he did indeed hear. Oh, uh, he's, I, th I, I thought he was nine. He's 11. But still, that's too young. <laughs> and uh, so I had to go have a conversation with my 11-year-old grandson the next day about you know what that was all about and all that stuff but anyway uh we're going to be coming back again this tuesday and uh ho finishing hopefully finishing that transcript that part of the transcript with cross-examination by daniel's attorney scott adams and uh it's going to be equally as interesting i don't know if it's going to be as vulgar and foul because i haven't read through all of it but I know that Scott Adams, uh, Daniel's attorney, will be doing his best to impeach the witness. And uh, it's going to get a little confrontational. So, you know, if it's interesting to you to hear confrontational banter back and forth in a courtroom trial, uh, definitely check in and, and check us out on Tuesday because it'll it'll kind of definitely get your mind going for sure. So we're doing that Tuesday at 5 p.m. Central. And uh Hopefully all of you guys can be there and check us out. Um, and thank you publicly on foul play to Jack, Susan, Kay, and Cherie, and Alice 
uh, for reading the parts in in uh, on my channel because none of them, none of these parts are easy to read. Oh, uh, and there's a lot of giggling and laughing because it's really kind of, at least for me, that's the only way I can get through it because it makes me so uncomfortable. And I'm not easily offended, but uh, <laughs> this is this is uncomfortable to read out loud. So I'll just I could imagine. Just out on Tuesday. Can't wait to see you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Jess Runt. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Jack61, what about yeah, yourself? Uh, yeah, I will say that it's definitely interesting testimony with this uh, accuser, um, God, anyway. So, yeah, definitely come and listen. Uh, we'll see what Scott Adams does and how he questions her. I'm, I'm really interested in how that goes. Other than that, um, this has been doing, you know, kind of the same old thing and um, just noticing a few things that have been going on in the community on X, uh, lack of, lack of, um, prior things that were going on have completely stopped, which is fine. Oh, you know, people, very quiet. It's yeah, gone very yeah, quiet. Texas yeah. Well. Yeah. It really has, which it, it fine with me. We've got plenty to talk about other than that. Um, yeah, we'll continue on tomorrow with, uh, part two on the open mic for this. We'll get the other four clips played and, you know, I'm sure we'll have more discussions, um, to go along with that. And the other, the other thing kind of going on, it's it's not really interesting to you guys probably, but the four-letter word is going to hit tomorrow here, snow. Oh. That, yeah, yeah, we're supposed to, it's not supposed to be a lot, but we've had. Oh, yeah. How beautiful and romantic just uh, in time oh. for the holidays. My God. I was just going to say, sorry to cut you off, Jack, but we had three inches of snow, uh, well, four inches by the time I got left the house Saturday morning. I mean, Friday oh, morning. So, yeah, oh, Lord. we got hit with snow on Thanksgiving. Ah! Wow. Well, <laughs> okay, well, no, I mean, it's just like I've said before, it's just one more thing to deal with here. Yeah. But I, I'll try to take a photo or two for you, Doc. I know you oh, guys listen. don't get snow. Yeah. So I've, that's pretty I've much about it. <laughs> You've never seen it in real life? Yep. No, 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 I haven't. I haven't seen snow. Uh, in Australia, where I am, it, it gets to like 45 degrees hot <laughs> with no snow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's too warm. Anyway, I want to thank uh, thank you, Doc, for uh, and uh, putting all this together and getting the clips and the, and the slides. Really good podcast tonight. I think we were more than fair with our I rebuttal. So. Yeah, I think so. And, of course, I want to thank everyone in the live chat that came and with their questions, comments, and so forth. So hopefully you can join us tomorrow, same time, 5 o'clock Central. Thank you so much there, Jack61. And next we have Neverly. What about yourself? All is well over here. Um, today episode was actually really good and mild. I expected more emotion to come out, of it, but actually it didn't. So that's good. I'm happy about that. And... Um, you guys, I, first of all, thank you, Dr. Selkman, again, for putting this together and for no, no, just giving it to us and asking for our opinions and everybody in chat. My goodness, you guys, as I uh, already wrote down, you've been here with us from day one and we keep growing and growing, which is awesome. And just give us some love right now. We have 18, li uh, 18 likes on that like button. And we had like almost 80 people or 80 people in the chat. So yeah, give us some love and like, share and subscribe. Correct. Thank you so much, Neverly. Much appreciated. See you tomorrow. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much. And next we have Susan. Susan, what about yourself? Um, yeah. Was a good yeah. Night? Oh. Um, <laughs> they got did get snow in Wichita today, which is just west of me, not too far. Uh, so far, we're we're okay. Supposed to be in the 40s tomorrow. So, and I will not be here tomorrow because I have oh. to celebrate Thanksgiving one more time. <laughs> Wait, one sorry. more time. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Double tur yeah. double turkey. Nothing wrong with turkey. that. Double turkey. Gobble, gobble. Are you having turkey tomorrow? We are. Yes. Sweet. Awesome. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you so much there, uh, 
Susan, much appreciated. And finally, we have, I don't recall. Well, thank you for another interesting show. I enjoy thoroughly rebutting Cam. I'm busy with um, um, working on Ashley Garth's case and um, and on Daniel's when I can. So that's what I've been up to. But thank you for another interesting program. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you very much. And just a, a couple of quick words. Um, I noticed that Hembury was uh, in chat. And I'll tell you what, if you want to know anything about the RAV4, uh, check out um, Hembury. Um, he's done a, a phenomenal amount of work on the RAV4. I, I believe it's on Reddit. Um, yeah, know, you know, 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 know your RAV series. It's on TikTok, uh, Reddit, and the wiki. Yep. If if you want to know anything about uh, Teresa's Toyota RAV4, go check it out. Hembury has done a phenomenal amount of great work on the RAV4, an yep. incredible repository of information. And uh, also Hembury has got a, a huge list of photographs uh, of the case on the Foul Play website. Please check it out. Jeepers, we're approaching over 800,000 hits on our website and well over a million hits on our YouTube channel. So that's been awesome. And I, again, guys, thank you so much for your support. It, it, you know, Cam, Cam hit us pretty hard. Cam hit us pretty hard. But the fact that our supporter numbers have increased um, and uh, you have guys, you've you've stuck around supporting us is uh, really, really warms us. And we're so appreciative of your support. And just my final comment. Trust me, uh, watching uh, Cam, um, episode one and episode two, has been not easy. It's been very, very, very hard. Um, you know, again, guys, if you want to see both episodes, uh, be very cautious. It's very, very confronting, and it's about to get worse. But we're here. We're fronting up. We're not shying away. We'll talk about it. But like I said, I wanted to get clips where we can naturally talk more about things and not hide things. And I, I think tonight's podcast really reflected that a real lot. Again, yeah. guys, thank you so much for your support. And uh, we will see you all tomorrow. Take care, guys. Hey, thanks again, everyone. I'm going to say this has been a File Play production. <laughs>